we might give them another minute or two BP, but um, it's up to you if you want to if you want to rock and roll right now. Uh, we are ready. Okay, Helena, why don't we why don't we begin, uh, Helena? Yes. Start, and then I'll give a little background information that'll give people some time to. to yeah. I think that's good. So welcome everybody, all of you. We have 120 people registered. They are all not on yet, but we are also running this on YouTube. So there might be people watching. I hope you have all been able to uh, check the wonderful videos that some of our scientific advisory panel members have prepared in advance of this uh, dialogue today and then the one tomorrow. Today we will focus on HFCs and our climate and clean air coalition's role in catalyzing the 2040 mitigation ambitions of HFCs. Uh, I just wanted to give you two, one minute maybe background on why this is so important for us right now. Uh, the climate and clean air coalition, as you know, uh, kicked off back in 2012, and we are now in this precise moment with our 150 plus partners developing a new 2030 strategy, meeting the moment. Uh, this is in response to our ministers and high level assemblies adoption of a new vision last year in September. And it's our response to uh, the fact that humanity is pushing up against all the ecological limits and triggering multiple crises, including as we live it right now, the COVID and Corona crisis. Uh, emissions of warming gases and air pollutants continue unabated, uh, driving climate crisis and amplifiers all others. And this is our quest. Uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, we are rising to meet these challenges and opportunities. Time is of essence, uh, and therefore, the underpinning scientific understanding of what we can do and it, what order we can do things to make and affect real change is, is what we are here to discuss with you today. Uh, public health, we, we want to redouble our efforts as a coalition to deliver concrete public health and economic benefits while simultaneously slowing the rate of near-term temperature change. So when it comes to HFCs, including energy efficiency and how we will help escalate the implementation of the Kigali Amendment. We have these excellent panels today, and I really recommend all of you to stay on for the three very full and exciting panels today. In terms of timeline for us in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, on, and our 2030 strategy, we are expecting to finish uh, off and adopt this strategy towards the end of the year. Our vision is to have an atmosphere to enable people and planet to thrive, stabilizing the climate with warming limited to 1.5 degree and rest drastically reduce air pollution. We will uh, work basically on three key directions. One is to drive an ambitious agenda. We will discuss this today. And in this context, it also links up with the Kigali Amendment. The second key direction will be to support national action and also breakthrough actions. What are the triggering areas where we can make a difference as a coalition? And also your advice today will be critical. And finally, the third key direction is for us to advance policy relevant research and analysis to provide decision makers the confidence to make ambitious commitments and take fast actions. And therefore the, climate, the, the scientific advisory panel of the coalition and these kind of science policy dialogues are an important uh, element for this. Plus the background documents, of course, that you have seen online and the videos. So over to you, BP, to introduce the panels and I'm all ears, over to you. Wonderful. Oh, can people hear me? Yes, yeah. there we, we go, you? okay. So, uh, thank you so much, Helena. My role here uh, today uh, as the coordinator of the scientific advisory panel here at the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is to clear clearly lay out what we're going to do and, and some of the ground rules of the day and then get out of the way so we can let our experts uh, talk about how we can drive ambition towards 2030, particularly around HFCs and uh, co-emitted pollutants with HFCs. So, the science policy dialogue is if I can, there we go. Uh, it's organized around three topics. We have three sessions. We're starting with the first session, equipment in use. Uh, 
avoiding the need for cooling, uh, opportunities and challenges that will be followed by a second session on life cycle management and uh, refrigerant end of life management. And then finally, uh, a closing session on cross-cutting opportunities and challenges related to HFCs, the phase down uh, and other issues such as the uh, cold food chain and how we can leverage those multiple benefits or impacts to drive drive action. Just uh, some ground rules for today. Uh, um, only the panelists are uh, have the uh, access to cameras uh, and and microphones. Uh, all of the attendees uh, are in this mode. Uh, you can, however, uh, send comments or questions to uh, the larger group of panelists or to individual panelists using the WebEx question and answer function. Uh, and you can, there is also a, a chat function that you can use uh, to, to chat with uh, all of the participants. For those of you who wish to uh, uh, interject and provide comments related to any of the, the session topics, uh, you will have an opportunity to do so in written form. Uh, you, at the close of this event, you will all receive a, uh, a post-event survey uh, that will that includes the three questions that will be asked to all of the panelists in all three sessions. We invite everyone to participate uh, in that. As Helena said, one of the clear objectives of the science policy dialogue is to uh, really help the coalition understand the scale of the opportunities and the correct leverage points uh, that uh, that it can apply uh, to drive ambitious action through this decade. Consistent with our ambition uh, to put this world on a safe path to 1.5 degrees. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna get out of the way. I wanna hand it over to the session moderator uh, for the first session, Durwood Zelke, president of the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. Durwood, please take it away. Thank you, and welcome everyone. So we have a, a very important task with the CCAC, as you all know, and uh, and I'll emphasize just a couple of points to kick us off. Um, the first one is that the time that we have to take aggressive action to slow down climate change is probably 10 years. So the IPCC 1.5 report lays this out for us, it says within uh, a decade, by the time we reach 2030, will be right at the verge of breaching the 1.5 barrier. And when that happens, there are a whole series of feedbacks that we're gonna accelerate and we're already accelerating and tipping points that we will trip past and we'll start uh, risking uh, an existential threat to the planet. So, so speed matters profoundly. That's, that's point number one. And I'll use the illustration of the Arctic summer sea ice to drive this point home. Uh, Professor Ramanathan, one of the members of the SAP for the CCAC has done a paper with Pistoni and uh, Eisenman calculating what happens when we lose the rest of the summer sea ice. And we just hit the, the September low uh, last week as second lowest on record. When we lose all of the reflective summer sea ice will add the equivalent of a trillion tons of co2 to our warming that's 56 ppm if you're doing the ppm it advances the two degree target by 25 years and that also could happen within 10 years so again speed matters profoundly and then we turn to our our treaty today the montreal protocol uh, widely regarded as the world's best environmental treaty and the best climate treaty. So the Velders team, who's Velders and, and his team, have calculated that the efforts to reduce the fluorinated gases, starting back with um, uh, citizen boycotts and then all the way through the Kigali Amendment, have avoided as much warming as CO2 has caused historically. In other words, if we hadn't done our effort to get rid of the fluorinated gases, we would have another 50 or 60 percent more warming uh, equal to what's caused by CO2 today, maybe even much more. So this treaty has done something phenomenal for the climate, as well as putting the stratospheric ozone on the path to recovery by 2065. So when you have a treaty that's this good, you have to ask, what else can it do? 
and we get to the Kigali Amendment, and we have 104 ratifications now. But uh, we need more. We don't have India yet. We don't have China yet. We don't have the U.S. yet. So a lot of the big players have yet to come on board. But we're making progress there towards universal ratification, which this treaty has enjoyed every single time in the past. There are a few other things that we are going to touch on today. So we have um, the banks, of course, that could get us even more than what we have with Kigali. And I hope we're going to talk about the HFC 23, which is generally not included in the calculations for avoided warming, but is a very big piece. And it is uh, required to use best practices under the Kigali uh, Amendment. So with that as, uh, as a, a, a little uh, uh, platform setting and, and mostly, you know, it's a it's a, a scary story and, and it's a good story. It's a story of hope with the mantra protocol. So if we've done this with this great treaty. We got to keep going and then we've got to use this as an illustration of what a sectoral approach can do to solve more and more of climate. All right. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Paula from uh, IASA to give us um, his presentation. And we, uh, we're we limiting you to five minutes only, I'm sorry, but see what you can do in five minutes. Thank you, Dear Wood. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. A very good morning, afternoon and evening to you all based on your respective locations. I will give a short presentation in which I will share the key findings of a recent EASA study on co-benefits of global HFC phase down under the Giga Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. So for this study, the three baseline scenarios, SSP3 pulling for all and Sensitivity K SSP1 scenario. So the macroeconomic drivers in these scenarios are consistent with IEA's World Energy Outlook 2017 from 2005 to 2040, and the respective shared socioeconomic pathways SSP scenarios from 2040 to 2100. The cooling for all scenario it focuses on how provide sustainable access to cooling within a clean energy transition and in turn support faster progress to achieve the goals of the Kigali Amendment. The baseline scenarios also consider all the relevant existing policies at the global level, such as HCFC phase out under the Montreal Protocol, regional such as EU FCAS regulation and national re regulations in several industrialized countries. So HFC emissions are expected to increase from 0.5 gigaton CO2 equivalent in 2005 to 4.3 gigaton CO2 equivalent in 2050 and to 6.1 to 6.8 gigaton CO2 equivalent in 2100 under a pre-Kigali baseline scenario. So the slower increase in the second half of the century is primarily due to saturation in many markets. So the expected pre-Kigali HFC emissions in 2050, they are within the range of previous estimates by Wilders et al. Stationary cooling equipment releases more than half of the global HFC emission, and that is primarily due to the phase out of HCFCs under the accelerated Montreal Protocol, uh, increasing wealth of households in developing countries and a warming climate. Our estimates indicate that the global cumulative HFC emissions from refrigerant use in cooling technologies will be over 300 gigaton CO2 equivalent between 2018 and 2100 under a pre-Kigali baseline scenario. So for the mitigation case, we have analyzed two scenarios, the Kigali amendment scenario and the maximum technically feasible reduction scenario. So HFC mitigation under Kigali amendment scenario is estimated to over 350 gigaton CO2 equivalent, and that is 87% below the pre-Kigali baseline. Similarly, MTFR scenario is estimated uh, to reduce more than 300 
50 gigaton CO2 equivalent, and that is 97% below the pre-Kigali baseline. Thus, we can say that there is a technical possibility for a further reduction of 35 to 40 gigaton CO2 equivalent, which will make additional contribution toward limiting the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Here you can see the electricity saving potential by combining energy efficiency improvement with HFC phase down for 2050 and 2100. So we assess both the technical and economic energy efficiency potential with alternative Kigali amendment and maximum technically feasible reduction scenarios. In 2050, the economic electricity saving potential that is marked here in red circle, it is more than 4,800 terawatt hour, and that is approximately equivalent to the current electricity consumption in the United States and Japan. So annual electricity saving potential, it almost double in absolute term by 2100 as compared to 2050. Our results reveals that if technical energy efficiency improvements are fully implemented, the resulting electricity saving could exceed 20% or one fifth of the future global electricity consumption, while the corresponding figure for economic energy efficiency improvement would be 15%. The combined effect of Kigali Amendment and energy efficiency improvement of stationary cooling technologies and future changes in the electricity generation fuel mix, it would prevent 441 to 631 gigaton CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions between 2018 and 2100, thereby making a significant contribution towards keeping the global temperature rise below 2 degrees centigrade. Here, the CPS, NPS, and SDS, these three variants we have used from IEA World Energy Outlook 2017. These are basically the implied emission factors taken from these scenarios. So the CPS is the current policy scenario. It means that, I mean, it will only incorporate the existing policies and NPS scenario incorporate existing policies as well as planned policies and sustainable development scenario, it incorporate high penetration of renewable and uh, energy efficiency and access to clean fuels. Reduced electricity consumption also mean lower air pollutant emissions in the power sector. So our estimates indicate in the first half of the century, the combined effect of HFC phase down and enhanced energy efficiency of cooling technologies will reduce approximately 4 to 10 percent of sulfur dioxide emissions, 7 to 16 percent of tox emissions, and 4 to 9 percent of fine particulate emissions at the global level compared with a pre Kigali baseline. In summary, we have estimated an additional mitigation potential between Kigali amendment and maximum technical feasibility reduction scenario, and identified co benefits in terms of electricity saving additional greenhouse gas reduction, and improved air quality in terms of reduction in criteria air pollutants. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, you were right on time, and your numbers are astounding. So congratulations on a piece of terrific work. This is um, consistent with what we've seen in the past, but much richer in the detail. And that's uh, that's most welcome. So thank you. T terrific way to start here. Okay, now um, uh, we're again we're moving along quickly because it's a busy schedule. So uh, I will turn to Idris from the uh, National Ozone Office in Nigeria, and Helen from AHRI to give their joint uh, presentation here. I don't know how you're dividing this up, but you have combined a total of 15 minutes, maybe a little less because we're we're a little slow in starting. So uh, over to you, Idris. Okay. Yeah. Right. There you Good go. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Yeah, I'm standing in for Chris because he has another assignment, official assignment. So he said I should stand in for him and make this presentation. All right. Yes, I'm uh, Nuruddin Mahmoud. I also work in the ozone office. 
Terrific. Yeah. So the presentation is on management of HFCs in Nigeria with energy efficiency improvements. Uh, the outline, as you can see, introduction, HFC management activities in Nigeria, what we have done, which includes the inventory of HFCs, enabling activities for ratification of the Kigali Amendment, where you have several activities uh, on HFCs, the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, which we are implementing now, which has uh, its windows and objectives, and the conclusion. Uh, on the introduction, uh, as you may be aware, Nigeria is a party to the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. The Kigali Amendment uh, aims to facilitate the use of low GWP alternatives in the rock sector while facing down HFCs. Nigeria the Kigali Amendment in 2018. We, we actually became the 65th party to the Montreal Protocol that ratified the amendment. Then I go straight to how we, what we are doing in Nigeria to manage uh, HFCs. Previously, in uh, 2008, 2008 to 2014, a survey was carried out, which was sponsored by CCAC with uh, UNDP as the implementing agency. This survey was carried out to know the quantities of HFCs imported in the country. What the survey came out with uh, includes some of this you are seeing on the screen. The total annual imports for that period, 28 to 2014, was about 5,080 5, metric tons. Uh, on an average basis, was given to be 725.77 metric tons. The distribution channel in the country uh, include importer to retailers, to end users, and uh, end users to importers. The survey inventory also discovered that there are already alternatives to HFCs in the country, which include hydrocarbons, ammonia, and water. Uh, opportunities presented in the country include the pilot hydrocarbon plant, which was sponsored by the MLF under our Hydrochlorofluorocarbon Features Management Plan, HPMP. This plant actually was commissioned in 2015 and is to produce hydrocarbon refrigerants for the RAC sector, uh, refrigeration and air conditioning sector, the servicing sector. So the inventory, the survey found out this. Well, challenges associated with the survey were in terms of adoption of these technologies. We have the issue of safety in the case of hydrocarbons, toxicity in the case of ammonia, and uh, high pressure in the case of uh, CO2. One of the activities we have uh, carried out also was uh, the enabling activities for the Kigali Amendment. The activities include awareness raising among stakeholders, where we had several workshops with HFC importers, distributors, uh, refrigeration associations, and we made them to understand the benefits of the Kigali Amendment. Actually, this workshop was, they were successful and it made them key in to the efforts of the government to ensure that the amendment was ratified early. There, were, there was also capacity building of the stakeholders on HFC management. Training needs assessment were carried out for the NOO on management of HFCs. For the customs, there was also training needs assessment on monitoring of importation of HFCs. Why for the technicians, 
there were training and assessments on alternatives to HFCs. Through the energy of activities also, we also did updating of our ODS regulation to include HFC control measures in line with the Kigali Amendment. One of the other activity that we carried out also to manage HFCs is through the intervention of the KSEP, the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program. The KSEP actually approved the project for Nigeria to improve energy efficiency in the cooling sector. The overall objective of the project is to develop a cooling strategy for the country and to ensure that Nigeria does not become a dumping ground for inefficient rack equipment. The project has two windows. One of the windows is integrating energy efficiency into the rack servicing sector. The objective is to address the barriers that were identified in the uh, improvement of energy efficiency, which our HPMP could not address. That is uh, training and enhanced curricula on energy efficiency practices in the servicing sector. Some of the activities to be done under this window include uh, demonstration activities using low GWP alternatives in rack equipment where you have energy metering devices and performance monitoring. Another activity is developing a syllabi for rack technicians on energy efficiency in the servicing sector. We also intend to train 150 servicing personnel on best practices to reduce uh, energy consumption, thereby improving energy efficiency. Okay, I'm gonna um, interrupt for just a moment and tell you that you have about one minute left. So we have some time for Helen as well. Uh, okay, okay, I will speed up. Yeah, window two is actually on uh, the transforming the market of inefficient rack equipment where the main activity is the rebate scheme, whereby we, you know, provide some incentives for replacement of inefficient rack equipment. Uh, presently, we have done the inception workshop for the project. We have strengthened collaboration with our stakeholders and uh, data gathering on this project is ongoing. In conclusion, Nigeria, the KCL project is going to complement our HPMP in terms of energy efficiency improvements in the cooling sector. So our country is, in, is on track to take fast mitigation measures, reduce greenhouse gases, and promote energy efficiency using low GWP alternatives in the cooling sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, and you were right on time. That, that's a, a, a wonderful uh, explanation of what a major country is doing to ratify and implement Kigali. Uh, congratulations, uh, it sounds like great progress. All right, um, Helen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. We didn't complete. We didn't complete about Okay, this is the I've seen the rest of you. If you could go on mute, would be useful. Okay, Helen. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I just wanted to talk with you a little bit about some of the practical matters that we're facing um, in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, we're working closely with also um, uh, the industry association in Canada and Australia around this transition. Um, so I'm Helen Multiteranoni. I'm the vice president of regulatory affairs at, at the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute (AHRI). Um, I should note that I am a member of the UN Montreal Protocol Technical and Economic Assessment Panel, uh, but that I am not uh, presenting on their behalf. Um, uh, this is just a little bit of information around uh, the uh, AHRI uh, membership. So it's uh, uh, 300 uh, plus members of manufacturers. Um, so I wanted to talk with you about the, the practical matters. Um, uh, Ni Nigeria and other parties are, are facing these issues as well as the US and non-A5 parties. Uh, this is a complicated transition. 
Uh, the properties of low global marine potential refrigerants uh, require uh, changes to uh, commercial practices um, and building codes to minimize risk while meeting climate goals. Uh, the historic refrigerants that uh, were in use 100 years ago, propane, carbon dioxide, and ammonia, as well as other low global warming potential HSD hydrofluorocarbon blends, have different flammability and tox toxicity uh, characteristics than the high GWP HSD refrigerants. So training is needed for uh, use of those refrigerants, as well as high pressure systems, especially for carbon dioxide. Um, and many jurisdictions require uh, changes to regulations and building code requirements to allow for the safe transport, storage, handling, installation, operation, and maintenance of these equipment types. Um, there's a significant body of work going on around the world, and I think it's very, very important uh, to share and to work together as stakeholders around these important issues, especially from a, because this is a public safety concern. Uh, so stakeholders can certainly work together for a successful transition. Um, I believe that uh, CCAC could help and uh, help create a, a roadmap for regulatory uh, safety standards and building code requirements that could be leveraged across jurisdictions. Uh, training could be shared internationally and training packages could be shared internationally. Um, and there's an opportunity for significant communication and networking to leverage learnings. Uh, just so you're aware, uh, AHRI has conducted, uh, in partnership with uh, the Department of Energy, uh, California Air Resources Board, uh, and others have invested nearly $7 million in, uh, to understand low global warming potential refrigerants. Uh, currently, there is research all over the world that will support optimization for future products. The objective of this research has been to provide technical results to support this uh, safety standard and building cone revisions related to the safe use of these refrigerants and make these results available for all. Um, here's just an example of some of the extensive research that has been completed related to flammable refrigerants. Now, this, all of this information is located and all the reports related to this testing are located on the AHR a technical institute um, website and are available for anybody around the world to uh, review and use um, in their work. Uh, we're trying to make this available because, again, this is a public safety uh, issue and we want to make sure that people understand what they need to do to uh, transition in a safe way. The other thing that we've done in the U.S. is um, kind of looking at the landscape and the pending regulations. Um, industry has been working with other stakeholders um, governmental uh, uh, entities, um, uh, NGOs, so environmental organizations, um, uh, building code officials, fire safety professionals, uh, insurance industry, and so on, to have a discussion about how to transition uh, to low global warming potential refrigerants safely. Uh, and in fact, we've created a task force at AHRI uh, where we look at um, the needs around training, uh, around installation operations and maintenance, um, uh, what needs there will be from a practical perspective for uh, facilities, so storage and uh, manufacturing facilities, and, and also um, at the end of life, so the, the safe recovery, reclaim, and destruction of flammable refrigerants, as well as safety standards and building codes. So uh, there are more than 200 members from more than 70 organizations. Um, we identify and resolve issues related to the transition and we're building on programs already in place around the world, and we're open to interested stakeholders. There's like some contact information here around that. Um, uh, and also, I, I, will, um, I will pause here and just mention uh, that I think that this body uh, could have a touch point, uh, maybe biannually or uh, quarterly, to have a discussion around uh, this, these safety requirements as well as training. Uh, to make sure that um, uh, this information is being shared across the, the uh, regulated entities. So across the world, uh, for A5 parties to access this information as well as non-A5 parties uh, to have access to all the work that's being done. Um, I think it's very, again, very important that we share. Um, uh, folks in Australia and Canada and other places have been very open uh, with the information that they have and sharing with folks in the US. And I, I think it's important that we share this across the world. Um, finally, um, I just want to uh, mention, uh, this is a very quick pr uh, presentation, but I just wanted to mention that we have started a webinar series. Uh, they are recorded and online, uh, but also if you'd like to sign up and participate, especially since around commercial refrigeration changes, um, 
we do have a session tomorrow, or sorry, Wednesday of this week, um, uh, discussing the refrigerant uh, research that has been, been done for the commercial refrigeration space. Um, so uh, this is just a very, very quick summary there, Derwood. Um, I also have slides here, and I'm, I'm not gonna go through these, but I'm just gonna quickly show that I think that Nathan, is, that BP is gonna give these to you. And so I just wanna show that we also have information kind of showing just the properties and so on of these refrigerants. Uh, which you can also find on our website. Um, uh, and again, if there's anything that we can do to be helpful um, in this transition, uh, we want to do so because we think it's very important um, to work together uh, for a successful transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. So uh, Helen and her group provide some very important background information for all of us. So please uh, check that out further and, uh, and you'll be rewarded with uh, great information. And of course, sharing our experiences and our data is, is important. So thank you. Um, now we turn to the guided dialogue and we have uh, Clarice from France. We have Philippe from Canada, uh, Aginias from UNDP. I don't know where you are um, in UNDP, maybe New York, and uh, Omar from uh, Cairo. So I'm told we have a series of questions that have already been presented to the panelists. And uh, I will just quickly go through them so that you all remember and the audience knows as well. The first one is, uh, where is the greatest technical and political potential where the CCAC can help deploy to catalyze HFC mitigation consistent with uh, the need to hit the 1.5 pathway? Okay, so that's what can we do as the CCAC? That's, that's a critical question. We're the only institution in the world devoted solely to the short-lived climate pollutants, and, uh, and we need to figure out our role here. Second. What are the key scientific, technical, or political barriers to overcome? How can the SAP and the broader CCAC scientific and technical community help overcome these barriers? And finally, where can the CCAC focus to make sure that we achieve mitigation by 2030 in the sector uh, that we're focused on here? So uh, I will turn uh, to who do I want to call on first? I guess I get to have my choice. So, Omar, do you want to kick us off? Um, thank you for the introduction and uh, these nice questions. I actually was uh, very pleased to see the uh, presentation by Palav, uh, Idris, and uh, Helen. Uh, it set the stage quite well. Um, in terms of the, the greatest technical potential, I think it, from the, the graph that uh, Palav showed, it's very clear that home air conditioners and commercial refrigeration have the highest potential. So if we can um, deal with these and find the low GWP alternatives, that is um, um, that would be a great solution. Um, in terms of the key scientific, technical, and political barriers, I think that the major scientific barrier right now is what can we do in uh, in area in, in developing countries where we are seeing larger increase in cooling requirements. Uh, so uh, high, there are high ambient temperature countries, there is India, there is China, and uh, there is a, an unprecedented increase, unprecedented increase in calls for uh, room air conditioners and refrigerators. So um, some refrigerants would work fine, but sometimes uh, we cannot use the uh, hydrocarbons because of the refrigerant charge limitations or due to safety issues. In terms of uh, technical, again, how can we reduce the refrigerant size in, in this equipment and maintain the, um, the safety? Um, is there other solution or are there any other solutions uh, that we need to consider so that we avoid um, uh, the complexity of this transition altogether? And finally, in terms of political barriers, um, so when when I looked at the Kigali Amendment and saw how um, the developing countries got you know uh, some relaxed relaxed uh, timeline, that was good in the beginning because you want, we wanted them to buy in. But now we need to work with them to make sure that it's a doing the public transition, moving from HCFCs to HFCs, and then moving to low GWP refreshments. It's very important to 
uh, work with them and catalyze solutions so that we avoid this public transition and move directly to low GWP refreshment. Um, in terms of where can CCAC uh, focus, um, I think providing uh, uh, capacity building and um, uh, providing the scientific and technical solutions to the developing nations to make sure that we can uh, work with both uh, the providing low GWP refreshments and at the same time, the energy efficiency. So we want to make sure that the next um, Air conditioning that will, air conditioner that we will be put on the market in uh, in Nigeria, India, Brazil, China, Egypt, uh, everywhere uh, in the developing countries where there is a large demand. These would be more energy efficient and environmentally friendly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we we need to avoid the uh, the dumping of the uh, inefficient IGWP equipment. In developing countries, that's another important piece. The these energy vampires come in and suck up the energy that's needed for development, and uh, we can't afford to have that happen. So, one one other question that's not on the explicit list here, but I want to pose to the the panelists is um, the non uh, uh, you know the not in kind. Uh, our title actually says uh, you know equipment in use and avoiding the need for cooling. So we can't forget the fact that we need to slow down climate change, that's number one, but also there are other non-mechanical ways to cool that the world used to know well, and uh, we need to rediscover. So keep that in mind as we move uh, along with the, the panel discussion here. So any quick comments on what Omar has just said from the panelists? Uh, I will uh, I'll move then to, um, Aginias in uh, UNDP. Can you uh, give us your take on these questions and any other comments you want to make? Tell me if I'm pronouncing your name right, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's that's perfect, actually. Um, you know, it takes some time even for some of my colleagues to learn to pronounce my name. So I really appreciate it. And I want to also thank the panelists for excellent presentations. I think Amar was quite right. Um, in fact, uh, when I was thinking about the potential of CCAC, I, I was thinking that, of course, one thing we have to all keep in mind that there are a lot of players, you know, Cool Coalition, KSAP, of course, MLF, but there is uh, also great demand. Uh, there is a lot to do, as you rightly mentioned, that the time frame is very short. And, and, and I thought of several areas where there is, CCAC could bring a value added. One uh, I thought was to lobby much more fiercely to include the cooling considerations, HFT considerations in the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, because those NDCs are actually looking at the time frame of 10 years. And so far, I, I think that although many countries are uh, you know, taking on this opportunity, but I think a lot of countries are losing on that. And I think CCAC could do a lot of work. And the second thing is, was actually what you mentioned about not in kind technologies. I was thinking that the passive cooling, you know, whereas MLF and other partners are doing great work on HFCs, but, uh, and, you know, energy efficiency, et cetera, the passive cooling uh, aspects are quite um, important and, and eliminating the need for, of, of the use of refrigerants. And I think there is a great, uh, a lot of challenges with regard to technical uh, uptake, etc. But CCC, of course, has an excellent experience in bringing uh, novel technologies, and I'm I'm thinking about CO2 critical technologies in supermarkets. Excellent mm -hmm. projects by Unido in Jordan, by UNDP in Chile, by IGSD in mobile air conditioning in India. So I think something like that would be very helpful uh, in terms of passive uh, uh, technologies, and also looking at you know, for example, district cooling. And I'll come back to that point when, you know, talking about one of those other questions. And of course, the last thing is uh, ODS waste management. And I think it, it's a topic of a, a dedicated session after this. So I'm not gonna go into that detail, but of course there is a great potential, but one has to keep in mind that ODS waste management does not come at the end. I think uh, Helen mentioned that it has to be part and parcel of H H uh, HFC phase down management plan. 
So that was about uh, my thinking about the potential. And in terms of uh, sci key scientific uh, barriers, I was thinking exactly uh, the safety issues, safety of natural refrigerants. And I think the presentation by Nigeria really emphasized it. There is kind of uh, sometimes even the issue of perception which prevents from taking up on these technologies. So CCAC's neutral status and scientific and technical potential may help uh, to come up with some kind of a neutral robust technology. Um, another thing I, I was thinking is that there is a still political barrier in terms of, as you rightly mentioned at the beginning, the biggest consumers of HFCs have not having ratified the Kigali. That's where I think CCAC's uh, convening power could be useful. And lastly, in terms of uh, uh, where can it focus, I was actually thinking exactly, I think Helen and Helen said it much better. There is a big uh, demand to look into the servicing sector because of challenges associated with HFC safety, um, but also because there are blends and you know many different alternatives, et cetera. So, and I'm thinking that uh, what could be provided through other mechanisms may not be sufficient. So, and, and there could be a role for, for the CCAC. And, and the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, in COVID stimulus packages, while a lot of countries are rolling out, it could be a good time to kind of see and find some creative ways of making sure that uh, sustainable, efficient cooling considerations are included there. Thank you. I'll, I'll stop here <laughs> for the moment. Uh, thank you. The, uh, the relationship with uh, the Build Back Better after the pandemic is very important. And I think the CCAC could do some welcome work on job creation. So as you do the HFC phase down, as we promote energy efficiency and uh, non-mechanical cooling, there are a lot of jobs, servicing sector, a lot of good jobs. And so this is one more thing I think we could put on the table for the CCAC. So thank you. Uh, and now to um, Philippe. So Canada has been a leader. You're the Montreal guy from Montreal. So what is your uh, advice? What are your insights? How do we get this uh, treaty to do the next big thing for the climate? And you'll have to turn them. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you for this introduction, uh, Durwood. And uh, hello, uh, everyone, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, maybe I'll try to address your question in a more you know, general way, because I think that uh, Ajinez, Omar, and, and others have talked about the barriers and pointed out you know, some, some important areas where the CCAC could be involved. Uh, but in my view, what is, what is most important to, to think about at this time is what would be the strategic objective of the CCAC with respect to HFCs or more generally the cooling sector uh, when you take into account energy efficiency as well. And maybe just to back up a little bit to talk about the, the, uh, the work of the HFC initiative. Um, what made this work particularly successful, at least in part, uh, was that uh, partners were uh, united around a very clear defined objective, which at the time of course was supporting an amendment to phase down HFCs under the Montreal Protocol. And this initiative was, was very important in helping to uh, design uh, activities. Um, with, with, this, with this idea in mind, uh, activities were designed based on what partners agreed was needed at the time to build global support for an amendment. Um, it's important to remember that at the time of the negotiation of the Kegeli Amendment, uh, the CCAC and many of its individual members were not only supporting a phase down of HFCs, but were pushing for an ambitious phase down that would include an early freeze. And in the end, the amendment that was agreed, while a great step forward for the Montreal Protocol and the climate, I think was somewhat less ambitious than what many countries had advocated at the time, uh, with a freeze in 2024 for developing countries and only 2028 or a small but significant group of developing countries. Uh, the large HCFC component that was included in the Kegali HFC baseline 
inflates the baseline to a point where, according to projections that were made by the technology and economic assessment panel, uh, aggregate HFC consumption in group one developing countries would only surpass the aggregated baseline by 2027. So until that time, basically uh, HFC consumption can continue to grow under business as usual. So 2027 is, is when you look at uh, what we're talking about here, mitigation uh, by 2030, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the phase on of HFCs in developing countries, while we were talking a lot about it, in fact, uh, after four years of the adoption of the amendments, uh, there has not been significant progress made. You know, the guidelines for the preparation and funding of HFC phase down plans have yet to be finalized by the executive committee of the multilateral fund. And the largest manufacturing developing countries have yet to ratify the amendments. Uh, so in this context, we need to consider whether under the present situation, the CCAC's goal of achieving SLCP mitigation by 2030 can be met with respect to HFCs in the cooling sector. And if it cannot be met uh, in the, under the status quo, perhaps there's an opportunity for the CCAC to play a role in accelerating global, global action. Um, one, one thing also to remember is, is the Montreal Protocol controls consumption and production. So when we're talking about 2027 for reduction in consumption, that will not be significantly felt in emission reductions until several years, several years later. Um, so here, here of course, we're, we're, we may have some mitigation coming from the developed world that had to have a 10% reduction as of 2019. But in the developing world, I guess the question is whether there's a possibility uh, for the CCAC to, to encourage faster action, not only through high level outreach and technical activities, but by demonstrating action among a group or coalition of countries that are willing to initiate the phase down of HFCs in advance of the Montreal Protocol schedule. And this could be manifested both through national level commitments and the implementation of targeted projects and activities that reduce HFC consumption while simultaneously enhancing energy efficiency in the cooling sector. Of course, that would mean that there would, there would need to be financial support uh, that is mobilized soon, either through the multilateral fund or other sources. And here the CCAC could play a role in by facilitating um, governments working together with financial institutions to identify and help secure such resources. Um, and we know that at least under the multilateral fund in the past, there is there are precedents for private, providing assistance to countries to meet advanced targets when governments provide clear commitments to meet such targets. Uh, so in my view, there are opportunities there, but I think the important thing is for the CCAC to be able to agree on, on a clear path forward uh, and to focus on it. And I think all the other issues that we're talking about, you know, on energy efficiency, uh, br bringing HFCs with an NDC, not in kind technology, et cetera, all that is fine, but it, but it must be done within uh, an overall framework uh, where the CCAC is catalyzing action towards uh, phasing down HFCs uh, faster than what what has been agreed and this this means working with uh developing country partners of the ccac i know that there are a number that would like to to probably move faster um but we need to have those those discussions uh with them and at least have, have, have a critical mass of, of of countries both low volumes and high volume countries that could be willing to start taking action uh, on the basis of financing that could be identified for them uh, through the CCAC and perhaps other partners. Um, so in, terms, in terms of the role of the SAP and the CCAC scientific community, I think that this objective could be backed up by scientific and technical analysis showing what the environmental benefits could be expected by 2030 under the status quo, uh, what cooling sectors and applications could be addressed and converted, uh, between now and 2030, and what would be the additional environmental benefits 
if such action was taken. So I think Palav was was talking a little bit about that in his presentation, uh, but perhaps this analysis needs to be uh, shared uh, a little bit widely so we understand better what what the benefits would be of moving faster. Thank you, Derwood. I think you're on, you're still on mute, Derwood. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the reminder. I'm on mute. So. Um, some terrific ideas there. Thank you. Uh, we do need to speed things up. So the CCAC, I couldn't agree more, should focus on what we can do. And I think finding that group of countries, and surely there are, industry is moving faster than the, the phase down schedule. In many cases, we have the alternatives and uh, and we could line up the funding. So I think that's a, it's a very good focus for us to, to uh, pursue in the CCAC. All right, now I'm going to turn to Clarice from France. So um, we've had President Macron uh, as a champion of the Kigali Amendment and the need for speed uh, through the Biarritz Pledge last August at the G7 and through his bilaterals with President Xi, uh, two bilaterals last year, and with uh, Prime Minister Modi, where uh, President Macron has encouraged and uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Xi have agreed that they will ratify Kigali. Now, they haven't done it yet, but your president has been pushing this. So give us uh, give us your insights as of today. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, thank you for having me uh, today. Um, so exactly, actually, for us, uh, the first imperative um, is to ratify the Kigali Amendments. And as you said, we have uh, 104 parties uh, to date, um, but we need to keep encouraging the remaining countries to ratify as soon as possible. Um, as we saw uh, in the presentations, um, cooling has a great potential for uh, avoiding uh, global warming. Uh, this should be um, highlighted in the long-term strategy and also in the enhanced um, national, nationally de uh, determined contributions. Um, I also heard um, Nigeria speaking about uh, leap, leapfrogging. Uh, it's very important to avoid um, uh, substituting HCFC by HFCs. We should leapfrog to zero or low GWP alternatives. Solutions are already available, um, and the CCAC HFC initiative has played an important role in the past. That on the energy efficiency side uh, of equipment. Um, and what we call the, the dual approach. Um, we have now the CCAC Efficient Cooling Initiative that was launched during the G7 Environment Minister's Meeting last year, during the G7 uh, Presidency. Um, we also launched the Biarritz Pledge for Fast Action on Efficient Cooling during the G7 Summit in uh, Biarritz. Both uh, the Biarritz Pledge and the CCAC Initiative aim to share lessons learned, facilitate market penetration, um, identify additional financing for improvement in energy efficiency beyond activities covered by the MLF. Um, both are meant uh, to keep high level attention to the imperative of uh, transitioning this sector, um, whose smart transition can play an important role to stay below 1.5, and the CCAC can be very instrumental uh, in uh, keeping this uh, high level attention. Um, this first session is also about avoiding the need for cooling. Uh, and for that, we need to take into consideration the buildings. Uh, working on energy efficiency of equipment is useless if we don't work on, on buildings. And we can decrease the need uh, for cooling with a smart building design, passive solution, as it was already mentioned, uh, nature based solution. And CCAC and the Global Alliance for Building as and Construction work on this together. France being involved in also in the in the GABC. Um, it was also mentioned uh, the important role uh, the recovery can play. Uh, the recovery plans can offer uh, an opportunity to do that better and put climate action at the center. And the cooling sector should not be forgotten, as uh, you also mentioned, uh, Darwood. France, we recently published our um, 100 billion uh, euro recovery plan called France Relance. Its first pillar is on the green uh, transition with uh, 30 billion euros. Uh, and it includes um, investment on energy efficient renovation programs, 
for private and social housing, and also for public uh, buildings. Um, so it surely gives a certainty for, for the sector, so which is uh, important. Um, I think um, the CCAC could also play a role in this field uh, and give it a space uh, to speak about recovery, recovery plans and share experience. Uh, actually, on this, we are collaborating with the Cool Coalition on a brief um, about the solution that can be considered in the context of recovery plan. Um, finally, um, we need also, uh, of course, uh, science uh, and publications such as the key facts on HFC prepared by the SAP was uh, it's very useful uh, because it's, um, it's a way to demonstrate why we need to focus on this sector. Uh, we can see that technical solutions exist, um, but to make them happen, we need well, to share lessons learned. Uh, and I think um, giving a space also to speak about the national cooling action plans could be very uh, useful. We have early movers, uh, India and Nigeria, Rwanda. Uh, we need to facilitate market penetration. And for that, uh, we should use the procurement, uh, which is a pow powerful lever. And the recovery plan can also play a great role in this matter. Uh, in the French uh, recovery plan, we have 6.7 uh, billion euros for building renovation. Of course, it's mainly about insulation in France, but there is also a whole uh, segment about adaptation to the summer temperatures and heat waves, especially uh, in the French overseas uh, territories. Um, we, well, as already mentioned, we need to identify additional financing for improvements in energy efficiency. Um, I think we, well, the, the CCAC could provide a space for a high level discussion between financial institutions, development banks, of course, uh, the MLF Secretariat, the Ozone Secretariat, and the Great Climate, Climate Fund. Um, one thing also on financing opportunities, um, France and the French Facility for Global Environment has just launched um, a call for projects, um, and it's called Sustainable Refrigeration and Air Conditioning uh, in Developing Countries. Uh, the a priority will be given to African countries. Uh, so the call is open until mid-October, mid so you still have a bit of time to um, so, um, finally, where, where the CCAC uh, should focus, well, Helena was mentioning the, um, the new strategy. Um, in the past, we had the HFC initiative. Now we have the Efficient Cooling Initiative. Um, as Philippe was mentioning, uh, I think we could um, work on, on cooling as a, as a whole, uh, as a sector, not having uh, different uh, initiatives uh, on the same um, sector. So I think um, CCAC was very uh, instrumental in the Kigali Amendment. It's a very what well, is well known for, for the cooling sector. Uh, we could keep uh, on working on, on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're a couple of minutes over, but this was a terrific discussion. Thank you. And and uh, Clarice, um, you're, you gave us some very important information that I'm sure that people who need more from any of the panelists, uh, BP uh, Nathan will be the person to send your email to. He'll coordinate this uh, or someone else on the CCAC staff. So the initiative you just mentioned on sustainable cooling and refrigeration, for example, I want to know more about that. That's uh, terrific. And uh, and thank you again for your leadership with uh, President Macron. Keep him uh, in the zone here. That's very important. I know you're you're the one pushing this. So thank you all. This was great. Uh, I'll turn this back to Nathan to wrap up. Thank you so much, Derwood, and thanks to everybody who's participated in this session. Uh, amazing uh, uh, presentations and comments, very concrete, and I think these are all things that we're going to take to heart as we move forward with the strategy development and uh, delivering fast action for multiple benefits uh, over this coming decade. And uh, we, we're almost on time, so that's uh, congratulations, Derwood, uh, in particular. Thank you for keeping us on, on task. Uh, we had, I, I, just to respond to that comment, please uh, do send me any comments. Uh, uh, also, everybody, as I said, you'll be receiving a post-event survey. That's where you can add comments and ask questions. Um, and we will be putting all of the materials from this event on uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition website uh, events page after this. So um, moving right along here, we're going to skip the intermission.
unfortunately, but it will keep us on time. Uh, so we're going to move directly to session two on lifecycle management. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our moderator, Bassam El Assad, uh, to, uh, and I will hand it over to you to, to kick us off. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan, and uh, thank you for Durwood for keeping on time. A uh, very interesting session, really. Uh, I'm the moderator for section two on life cycle management of refrigerants. Uh, this session will highlight three aspects, actually. The current state of refrigerant management at the end of life, the opportunities for mitigation until 2030, and how the CCAC can support more ambitious measures within the 2030 timeframe. This session is organized uh, with the Ministry of Environment in Japan. The Honorable Koizumi uh, Shinjiro, Minister of Environment, launched the initiative on fluorocarbon life cycle management, known by the acronym IFL, at the COP25 in Madrid in 2019. The initiative addresses fluorocarbon emissions throughout the life cycle, including leakage and venting at the end of life. And it does this by facilitating actions, innovation and collaboration among governments, the private sector and international institutions. Uh, as at today, there are 13 state and intergovernmental organizations partnering with the 10 private sector companies and NGOs. Now, refrigerant life cycle management is of particular importance for the implementation of the Montreal Protocol and the Kigali Amendment for phasing down the HFCs. In particular, low refrigerant volume consuming countries known as LVCs are always looking for efficient ways to manage refrigerants, especially at the end of life. And they're also looking for best practices using by industrialized uh, countries. This session is actually in two parts, like the, all the other sessions. The presentations by three speakers will give an overview of trends and mitigation measures to showcase regulatory, economic, and other mechanisms available to policymakers in order to support the implementation of these measures. And then there will be a panel discussion also with four panelists uh, uh, responding as a guided uh, session, responding to, um, to the questions, and they will discuss the technical and, and political potential to catalyze mitigation within the 1.5 uh, degrees C pathway by 2030. Each part is 30 minutes, so we'll have to keep to time. Now, to, uh, to start with, uh, Dr. Noburo Kagawa of the National Defense Academy and member of the CCAC Scientific Advisory Panel, SAP, will give us a scientific background presentation on the refrigerant circular economy. Dr. Kagawa, you have more or less five minutes or a little bit more if you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, I, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nobo Kagawa. I just uh, thank you very much for your uh, introduction, Bas. Uh, I would like to the, uh, to introduce to the uh, the title and uh, just to the next slide. To, uh, this slide. This slide is very important because uh, uh, there are many discussion of today. Uh, there are two Paris Agreement and more important. And also we have a concern about SDGs. That's also the total uh, global target. And there is a three triangles I just picked here. There is a very important uh, items. First one, the loaded lift charge with high efficiency is the second one. The third one, safe and sufficient fulfilling life. That's what's very important for the uh, Cuban people to go. Next slide. Okay. Yeah, uh, there is, uh, uh, in order to reduce the GDP, we have many uh, uh, study or technology concerns. <coughs> There is, I just brought uh, the uh, diagram. There is a uh, uh, horizontal is a uh, normal point, point. It's very important for this uh, some dynamic cycle. And uh, they are, uh, the bottom uh, bar is uh, data P number. The black one is kind of the uh, conventional one. 
Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, conventional wise, a high GDP and uh, but and also the uh, no from the propagation and safe materials. But uh, the next one should be a mild GDP, we can call it to health, and uh, with low probability, slightly dangerous, we must take care. And uh, the last one is very good for the us, really low GDP. Advanced, we can say advanced lift charge, but higher probability. That's very important, very dangerous things. As you can see, unfortunately, there are no good uh, lift charge because uh, we can see the normal boiling point between the around minus 55 to the minus 25 degrees C. There's uh, no good uh, candidate for uh, with safe with low GDP1. So that's very good. That's very big, big, big problem for us. So of course there is some kind of the special one like uh, R123YF and also the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide unfortunately the, uh, beyond of the lower side of minus 70 degrees C is normal body point. <clears throat> it's very difficult to uh, design a system. And uh, that means the uh, there is lacking the uh, no single revision to satisfy all requirements. So we must develop the mixture, mixture with the required, but we must take care. Mixture need a high technology. So there is a just list of the candidate or low GW revisions. There are many revisions using for the uh, refrigerator or air conditioner. But uh, uh, still, there's still difficulty to use this for the application. But we just going, going. Later, I will show you. But uh, just please find the important thing. There is a candidate, many candidates, but some most candidates, including the uh, conventional literature, like uh, 125, 134A, or R32. That's a very key point, important issue. Of course, we have a very low GDP number of uh, lift charge, R123, OYF, for example, and the carbon dioxide for propane, uh, the uh, so ice water. But still, uh, we need a such kind of conventional restaurant as a component. And this is a Japanese target of the uh, developing low GW uh, Just showing the uh, product name, we can say designate product. For example, household air conditioners, air conditioners for the uh, stores or keys, and uh, Mac, the automobile air conditioner. Uh, there is a lighting about the GW goals and the target years already passed almost them. And there is a typical, uh, the conventional lifting, we can say, there is a lighting of the GW and uh, the safety code. A is uh, uh, non-toxic, B means toxic. One, two, three, four, one, two, three means uh, uh, probability. Why is there? Three is a uh, very dangerous. Uh, there is an alternative lifting, and uh, I can say, we can say, most of them just we can find a success way. Uh, some of them just midway. For example, this condensing new stationary type of refrigerator. Uh, some of there is uh, there are many companies they announced uh, the uh, new product. So uh, we can say in Japan, most such kind of designer product find success wide. But uh, this is the next diagram I just prefer for you. Uh, the horizontal is a bank of lifting in the in the in the, our, uh, in the market. The, the vertical one the leakage. The circle black circle one is uh, just uh, just two on, uh, two or two, twelve and before uh, starting the designating the product system. And uh, after mm -hmm. replacing to the uh, target lifting with a target GDP, the let a uh, black circle become to the uh, go to the red one. 
So it becomes very low, slow, low leakage, including the emission after the discard. But uh, still, there is some is a high values. For example, the air conditioner and uh, large size air conditioner and the display case. Still, we must take care of these issues. These are products with lower GDP. And uh, also, the, uh, even though we can change the uh, left run to the, uh, such kind with low GW1, but it takes about uh, 20 or so, at least 10 or 20 years to replace in the city the poor things, so the domestic one, or the commercial one. <coughs> Sometimes it takes uh, 20 or 50 years to replace with a new one. It's kind of an economic situation. <laughs> so this is just from a uh, diagram. Just a flow, I, I, I can say, uh, lecture flow diagram. The top side is a uh, uh, flow curve production. And uh, there is a three part is uh, uh, just uh, installed in the production. Uh, the other one is uh, just uh, using it for charging process for the installation. This is for the main transport size. This is uh, using for the uh, the uh, lecture during the operation. That means 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. It depends on the uh, product and the users. And the black one is uh, released during operation. It's a very big number. As in, this is a ratio to the uh, uh, introduction to the market. And this is an uncovered amount. Dr. Kagawa, one minute more, please. Thank okay. you. Just one thing. Uh, this is uh, uh, in the market, the bank one. So I think the, we can reduce this one. Oops. And uh, just reduce the, the uh, black one and uh, just destroy the CFC, HCFC and the high GWP. And just the maintenance, just using the uh, legal one for the uh, reclamation for the maintenance. Uh, this is Japanese situation. This is just including the uh, reclamation number for each year, including destruction. And this is the recycling rate. As you see, I can say just say paper, uh, the old paper recycling <coughs> rate is about 64% in Japan. And PET about about 85 percent. So this is why we and also Japanese government just increasing number as uh, the different recycling number to the same number like this one. Uh, this I can say always say is present cycle economy. Uh, this is just starting with, with low GW trend and uh, just uh, go around and uh, some important restaurant must be declaration. And the uh, high data one for CFC, CFC must be destroyed. And let's try to reduce the uh, emission and the leakage. Last one. So I just, you know, I want to skip, but uh, I can say just important things. Just try to find the goal. We must uh, uh, the uh, something important thing, including the recovering and leaks, that is our uh, reclamation. So, and uh, the final one is uh, just to find the, uh, the situation of the uh, recent flow is in each country and uh, try to establish total RMC cycle, uh, refrigerant management cycle, including use, and try to drive RMC in the certain region area. That's we go to the uh, end of life of the refrigerant plumbing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kagawa, for uh, a really enlightening uh, uh, presentation. And for laying out this proposal for the uh, RMC, the refrigerant management uh, cycle. Now, uh, next, thank you. Next, we will hear from uh, Ms. Asako Toyozumi, uh, the Director of the Office of Fluorocarbon Control Policy at the Ministry of Environment of Japan, who will present Japan's policy and legislation of, on refrigerant life cycle management. Ms. Toyozumi, you have uh, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Asa, for your kind, kind introduction. Um, I'm Asako Toyozumi from the Ministry of the Environment, Japan, and the Initiative on Floral Carbon Lifecycle Management. We are very pleased to co-host this event with CCAC. 
Also, I'm very honored to present a uh, policy and legislation on life cycle management of refrigerants here today. Our floral carbon management policy covers the life cycle of refrigerants from its production and use to its recovery and destruction. I hope my presentation will provide some insights for those who are developing or planning to develop a legal framework or a system for the life cycle management and flow carbons. Next, please. Um, this study shows the background and history of overall carbon control policy development. Along with the ratification of Montreal Protocol, the uh, ozone layer protection law was established in 1988. Then, after CFC production phase out was completed in Japan, the Home Appliances Recycling Law was established in 1998 and enacted in 2001. Since then, our government has made gradual steps to strengthen the controls through the legal instruments regarding home appliances, commercial refrigerators and air conditioners, and automobiles. In 2015, the Act on Rational Use and Proper Management of Floral Carbons was established, uh, renaming the law concerning the recovery and destruction of floral carbons providing comprehensive approach throughout the life cycle of floral carbons. This act was revised last year and enacted in April this year in order to strengthen the obligations of owners or users of refrigerators and air conditioners at their disposal. Next, please. This slide shows target products and corresponding regulations regarding controlling floral carbons. It may sound complicated that for carbons from commercial refrigerators and air conditioners, automobile air conditioners and domestic uh, refrigerators and air conditioners are controlled by different regulations. In Japan, it is effective to control for carbon emissions in line with waste management policy, particularly for vehicles and home appliances. Next, please. This flow chart shows Dispose home appliances, uh, how disposed home appliances are managed under the home appliance recycling law. Responsibilities of disposers of refrigerators and air conditioners. Uh, their retailers and their manufacturers or importers are clearly defined in this law. Disposers or consumers are required to pass over their used home appliances to retailers and to pay the fees for collection, transportation, and recycling. Retailers should collect those used appliances and pass them over to the manufacturers of these appliances. Manufacturers are obliged to collect and recycle them as well as collect for carbons from used appliances. Next, please. This slide shows for carbons, uh, how flow carbons are regulated by the Act on Rational Use and Proper Management of Floral Carbons. In detail, floral carbons used in commercial refrigerators and air conditioners are two targets of this Act. Uh, it defines the responsibility of floral carbon producers, product manufacturers, uh, product users, floral carbon filling and the recovery operators, and recycling and destruction operators. I would like to highlight that under this regulation, users are obliged to inspect the equipment regularly and report the amount of leakage, if any. And for carbon filling and recovery operators are required to be registered by law. And for carbon recycling and destruction operators are required to be approved by law. In 2019, the Act was amended to improve the floral carbon recovery rate, which had been around 40% since the Act was applied. More stringent obligation is now imposed to the stakeholders, so now we hope to increase the recovery rate up to 70% by 2030. For example, if a user does not recover floral carbon at the time of equipment disposal, he will be fined no more than approximately $5,000. Uh, users also need to submit a certificate of flow carbon recovery when they deliver the disposal equipment to scrub uh, or recycle operators. 
uh, commission operators are required to save documents as a proof of presence or absence of designated equipment. Scrap and recycle operators are obliged to confirm the completion of coral carbon recovery by checking a certificate before they receive disposed equipment, and a breach of this rule is subject to a dialogue to the party. Alex, please. By trying to improve our domestic policy for floral carbon livestock management, we also believe that given the growing amount of refrigerant banks, global efforts to address floral carbon uh, management uh, have become more essential. Therefore, mm -hmm. as Assam explained at the beginning, we have launched the uh, initiative on floral carbon livestock management at the uh, COP25 last year. Uh, the aim of this initiative is already uh, introduced by Vassam, so I'm not going to repeat that. But um, after the launch of the initiative, uh, 13 states and international organizations signed up to the in, uh, initiative already, and we expect more. I'm very pleased to say that CCAC is one of the first international organizations to endorse this initiative. Uh, we especially appreciate the existing framework, such as the Efficient Cooling Initiative under the CCAC, which focuses on upstream of the life cycle of raw carbons, and our collaboration will enhance our activity effectively. Since the launch of the initiative, we call for an online event with CCAC at OAWG42 this year in July. And also, we had a stakeholder meeting uh, online this month uh, to share the knowledge and activities and to strengthen the engagement among the stakeholders. We'll continue our work to promote life cycle management of rural carbons, and your contribution and participation is most welcome. Thank you for your attention, and we hope that the importance of life cycle management of all problems will be acknowledged to the CCAC strategy for the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Izumi, for uh, for sharing. Uh, Dr. Izumi, sorry, for sharing with us uh, the the uh, the policy in Japan, and on the rational use and proper management of uh, fluorocarbons. Uh, I say it's it's heartening to learn that Japan is planning to increase the recovery rate uh, at the time of disposal from the current 40% to more than 70% in 2030. This is really good. Now, uh, our last speaker uh, for today is, uh, uh, before we move to the panel, is uh, Ms. Latina Sari from the Directorate of Greenhouse Gas Inventory Monitoring, Reporting and Verification at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry <laughs> of Indonesia. Uh, who will share with us the experience of her country on MBR. Ms. Ratina Sari, you have 10 minutes, please. Uh, good, good, good uh, evening, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, you late late uh, here in Indonesia. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to uh, give a presentation regarding overview of uh, F-Gases inventory in Indonesia. Uh, just could give me a minute to share my screen. Wait a moment, because You need help from the uh, organizer. Uh, uh, yeah, I think so because I cannot. Uh, it it said that uh, I have to leave the event. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, Ratna Sari. Could you please try to share your screen by using the button? Yeah. Share. So uh, and just choose the application. Yeah. I tried it, but uh, it said that uh, I need to leave the meeting or uh, there's, there's a question. You have a share, you have a share yeah. button there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you press it, it says leave the meeting? No. 
Yes, it's uh, it said that uh, I have to leave the meeting. Do okay, we have the same presentation for the yes. answer? We can share it, and if you can give us the share function, we can share it. Maybe Miss Latina Sari can talk from Indonesia. Yes, Tatiana, either share the have uh, Japan one be the there we go. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your help. So uh, maybe to the second slide, uh, the outline of the uh, presentation. Uh, the next slide. So uh, in this presentation, I will uh, talking about uh, uh, regarding the institutional arrangement of GHG inventory and the current FGASES inventory and uh, identify gaps and challenges in prepare, preparing the FGASES inventory, including the effort to address them, as well as uh, future plans for sources that have not been covered uh, previous, previously. Uh, next, please. So uh, the first, it's an institutional arrangement. So as we can see that uh, we work with so many uh, key stakeholders in our uh, country uh, to uh, conduct inventory, so, such as uh, in energy, IPPU, agriculture, forestry, and waste. So, uh, so far we have uh, built a system an institutional arrangement for conducting uh, uh, inventory. Uh, next, please. The current status of uh, GSG inventory for uh, F gases. So we have an online system actually to collect uh, to collect uh, the data or information uh, from subnational and from national. Uh, we call the from national. We have online system. We call it Science Smart, uh, where we can collect the data from uh, local government, from North party stakeholders, and from the related or uh, key uh, min, key line ministry. And we also have public uh, reg, uh, registry system. We call it SRN. Uh, then uh, it collects the data for mitigation action that conducted by party and non-party stakeholders. Uh, next, please. So uh, for FG, uh, F gases, uh, we are on the way to identify source of F gases. Uh, not 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 many F gases that uh, we have uh, been identified due to we have a barrier in uh, for uh, collecting the data and information from our uh, key stakeholders and also from uh, sub, sub national and uh, we don't have yet uh, one policy data for everything so we need to seek the information uh, from uh, the uh, line ministries and also from the uh, sub national level because we cover so many uh, uh, islands in Indonesia and province. So that's why it's a uh, big, uh, and the capacity of each uh, uh, local governments are very, uh, some of them are more advanced than the other, but uh, uh, the, the other part of Indonesia, they still needs capacity building. So that's why we have uh, uh, some difficulties in collecting data and information, uh, especially on F gases use. Uh, uh next please and this is also uh we uh, try to collecting the data for from uh, uh another source of uh, f gases next please and uh, this uh, uh, uh slide also uh, show us uh, for industrial process we still uh, uh try to identify the data from a military ap application and accelerators. Next, please. Then uh, for as for the FGSS inventory status, as we, uh, we you can see in our biennial update report in our second B BUR, we have reported FGSS only for uh, CV4 and C2V C2F6 from aluminium and aluminium production. 
So uh, it's a, a voluntary uh, act by our, our country that uh, we collect uh, uh, that uh, uh, FGCS uh, data in or information. Uh, next, please. So uh, in this uh, uh, slide, we can see uh, how we identify the uh, magnesium product, uh, the, the aluminium production uh, in our second board. Uh, next, please. Uh, the gaps and challenge that we uh, face uh, is the availability of activity data to estimate the GHG infant emissions from product use as sub substitutes for the ODS. Uh, so, uh, as we know that uh, all ODS use in Indonesia is imported, so we don't produce any ODS. So, the import of ODS has been identified. However, it could not be distinguished either the ODS used in the new products or substitute due to uh, the, dat the data and information uh, are not clear yet. So, we, we still uh, have a cooperation with Ministry of Trade to identify or uh, to get the data uh, for the OD ODS use, either for new products or substitute. substitute. Uh, next, please. So uh, what we are uh, now trying to uh, seek uh, the data is for uh, CH2F or CF3 and then uh, uh, CH3 C, uh, CH and then CH3 CH2 CH3 uh, and then also uh, uh, R290. Uh, As for R12, uh, we, we are not, uh, we don't include it because it's not the, uh, it's the, uh, the subject under Montreal Protocol. Uh, next, please. So the effort to address the gap and challenge. Uh, first, we need to identify the activity data for re refrigeration and air conditioning in the new products, such as stationary AC, mobile AC, and refrigerant. Uh, this data is still scattered, and then we still need to improve our uh, data collection system, and then uh, also uh, increasing the capacity uh, for the uh, for uh, collecting the data from the from the stakeholders. Uh, next, please. And then the efforts also we currently uh, is in the process of HFC uh, survey and regulatory. We conducted uh, under uh, Ministry of Environment. Uh, next, please. And the future plans. Uh, we are planning to identify the other source of F gases, specifically in SF6 uh, for, uh, for electricity transformer. And then maybe perhaps because we identified that uh, SF6 is, uh, is used in sports shoes industry, so uh, we still uh, conduct uh, research on that. Uh, we cooperate with uh, the university uh, uh, to uh, to identify the other source of F gases. Uh, next, I think this uh, this is my presentation. And then, uh, if uh, you have any question regarding my presentation, I will be happy to assist you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ratensari, for uh, for this revealing and uh, presentation. Uh, actually, uh, very good efforts on the uh, uh, you know on, on on identifying the challenges for data collection and uh, and thank you for sharing this online system and about the the public registry. Uh, now the next part, this is the uh, the panel discussion. I, I remind the audience that they can uh, use the Q and A function to provide written contributions, and these contributions will be reflected in the discussion report. For the panel today, we have four panelists from government institutions and uh, organizations. We have uh, Uli Uli Christian Kvissel, a senior advisor for the action for the section of climate science at the Norwegian Environment Agency. 
We have uh, Irene Paps of Heat International. Heat is an independent consulting firm that provides expert advice on global uh, actions against uh, climate change and for the production, protection of the ozone uh, layer. And we have Asmaul Jibril overseeing head mitigation division at the Federal Ministry of Environment in Nigeria. And uh, we have uh, Tetsushi uh, Okada, he's the president of Japan Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Industry Association, Jaraya. Uh, Tetsushi is uh, also a, a fellow ARTOC member. Now, uh, let me uh, try to make uh, uh, this a little bit uh, interactive by not asking all the questions altogether, if the panelists don't mind. And then let me start by asking uh, Okada-san. Okada-san, what do you think is the greatest technical and political potential where the CCAC and or the Initiative uh, on Fluorocarbon Lifecycle Management, I IFL, can help deploy to catalyze mitigation consistent with the 1.5 degree C pathway by 2030? Uh, can uh, you can um, do this considering your experience from Jaraya and from the I, uh, IFL? Thank you, Basam. Uh, how are you? Uh, uh, thank you. Good. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, have a great opportunity to say something in uh, CCAC Science Policy Dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, life cycle management of HFC is very important for climate change countermeasures, and it is necessary to proceed with uh, countermeasures from upstream to downstream in parallel, uh, especially from the viewpoint of upstream equipment manufacturers. Uh, refrigeration and air conditioning uh, equipment has been used in the market for a long time. So if the refrigerant contained in it is uh, high GWP, it will be used for a long term, such as service applications. In order to avoid such a situation, equipment manufacturers need to urgently switch to low GWP refrigerant or a natural refrigerant in cooperation with uh, stakeholders. The concept we are working on is uh, S plus three E's. Uh, this means uh, S is uh, safety, and three E's are uh, environmental performance, energy efficiency, and economic feasibility. Uh, I think uh, it is very important that uh, these are established in a well-balanced manner. For that purpose, uh, technology for improving the performance of uh, elemental parts, such as heat exchangers and compressors, and reducing the air conditioning load by improving the performance of building buildings are also important uh, for technical issues. In terms of policy, it is necessary to proceed relaxation of laws and regulation that uh, enable these to function uh, effectively. Thank you very much from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Okada-san. Uh, I believe uh, our uh, colleague Asma is having uh, difficulties uh, uh, in connecting. So let me ask Ole the, uh, the same question. What is the experience uh, from Norway, especially that since Norway is a partner of the CCAC uh, regarding, so, the, regarding the technical and uh, political and potential? So thank you, Basam, and, and uh, thank you to the CCAC and also the government of uh, Japan for, for hosting and, and co-sponsoring this uh, event. It's, it's very timely and it's, it seems to be a very meaningful seminar uh, to, to be able to create a, a, a new strategy for, for the CCAC. Uh, and me, Ole, uh, can you switch your uh, video on, please? I thought I had done that, but let's see if this one is better. Is this better? Do you see me now? Yes, thank you so much. Much better. Uh, <laughs> thank you for for letting me know. So, so as I said, I, th I think um, it is very timely and meaningful uh, to have this seminar and to further build on, on the CCIC's strategy, and especially in light of the temperature goal under the Paris Agreement, and also, of course, uh, due to the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. So, first and foremost, I think it is very important that, that CCIC build further on the very good relationship uh, between uh, them and the uh, Ozone family. And, and uh, as an example, I think uh, the CCIC was, uh, was played a very crucial role in the build-up to the Kigali Amendment. 
uh, when when they um, uh, did the initiatives to build national inventories and helping partings to the Montreal Protocol to get a better overview of their situation. And and my sincerely hope is that that first and foremost CCAC will continue as a vital part of the Ozone family uh, and also pay attention when the protocol now further develops in light of the CFC 11 situation and also when the implementation of the Kigali amendments kicks in for real. Um, so based on Nor Norway's approach, um, uh, I think we we have tried to, to make our sort of end of life treatment uh, quite sustainable. Um, and I think that is also a big role for CCAC to, and also maybe for the initiative that Jap the Japanese government has started now is to, to gather uh, such stories and, and to gather the knowledge about such uh, projects. And, and what we have in Norway is, is a sort of tax and refund scheme. So it, it is actually quite straightforward. We, we start by defining HFCs as a hazardous waste and and, and so we have included a, a tax on HFC imported, both in bulk or in, in products. And then we have also designed a refund that actually equals the tax uh, for every uh, GWP ton of collected and destroyed HFC. Uh, and, and of course, the, the main purpose of this is to increase the collection of gas, uh, thereby uh, preventing it from being leaked to the atmosphere. Uh, but it's also to justify uh, this HFC tax as an emission tax. And, and that also goes into more awareness about the possibility to, to de deduct uh, avoided emission when parties are reporting to the Climate Convention. So, especially when, uh, when with respect to the ongoing global stock take process, where parties are, are, are meant to deliver a new updated and more ambitious NDCs every fifth year. Um, so the, the other thing I also would like to mention here and, and may, as an example for where the CCIC could work in the future, uh, and, and that is also the need and role of and use of natural refrigerants and, and also not in kind technologies. Uh, of course, this session is mostly talking about end of life, but but in a way, if we could also prevent this life from starting, in a way, it, it would also uh, be a big uh, gain for, for, um, for the climate uh, thing. And, and I think there that uh, CCAC could play a role to market and demonstrate projects uh, where such solutions, uh, solutions are used and implemented. So, so I think I'll stop there now and, uh, and I'll come back with more on maybe that uh, second part on natural refrigerant later, if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Uli. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the best part of uh, mitigation is not to start something, as, as you said. Uh, now, let me turn to Irene. Hello, Irene. Uh, and uh, Irene, in your view, what are the uh, key scientific, technical or political barriers to overcome in order to bring the measures to scale? Maybe you would like first to uh, give us a little bit of background of where you see the potential and then go into the barriers. So uh, sure. I'll give you a chance to do that. Sure. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Bassam. I uh, actually want to second also what Ole said, um, not starting this life would be the best mitigation option in the end. And we could like, yeah, don't have to do all of this in the first place. And this is also my plaidoyer to really go uh, quickly to alternative substances. But since we're having already now a lot of uh, HCFCs and, and HFCs around that we still have a lot of them in the future, in the business usual, let me talk about this also. Um, what struck my mind actually first that this session is called on life cycle of refrigerants, but it's actually we stopped at destruction or there was only one little sentence by Dr. Kagawa, at least it was on in the writing, but it said uh, recycle fluorine effectively. So what we still have to keep in mind, besides every, all these um, issues of collecting the, the refrigerants, but destruction is not a sustainable solution because fluorine is not really an really abundant substance. So when we destroy all the HFCs, we are managed to get hand on, then we actually, as long as we don't go really to alternatives, um, just create a case of producing more HFCs. And this is something that I don't really want to see to happen. And I want also to, to uh, 
yeah, say that all those different blends that are now, now being invented to replace all, all uh, the, the HCFCs make it even more difficult to recycle and reclaim refrigerants. Because as long as it was only, or only, but it was R22, recycling was, straight, was quite straightforward. But now with all those different blends, being 410A, being 404A, with different um, substances in there, they demixturize and, and uh, dissolve in different ways. So um, just uh, recycling it is really not, not easy. So we are creating more trouble in all bringing these blends actually into the market. So when you ask me about scientific potential, I think there would be a scientific potential to think when actually thinking about what refrigerant could be a good solution to also think about how it could be recycled and, and reclaimed in, in the end. And don't stop at, yeah, it's a good re replacement for R22 in this specific uh, um, application. So I think there's still quite a bit also room for improvement for reclamation since it's at the moment, it's a dif the difficult thing to do. And I think it will also be a quite difficult thing, thing to do, but maybe it's still a, a way to, to look into it where, uh, yeah, more capacities could be done for reclamation, not only destruction. I think I'll stop here for the moment and give the others also room and uh, you might come back later with some different question. Is that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, thank you. Um, uh... I, I do agree with you. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the, but uh, I'd like to mention one thing about destruction. I mean, destruction, maybe we're concentrating on the HFCs, but also all the banks of the uh, ODS substances that need to be taken care of. And in of discussions that we had with the parties, uh, especially, as I mentioned, the low volume consuming parties, this came out as really one of the major uh, uh, obstacles mm -hmm. that they have. Now I'm, uh, I'm I'm glad to um, uh, to tell you that uh, Asma was actually uh, able to join us. So uh, welcome, Asma, and uh, uh, you know we'd like to hear from you, uh, you know, about uh, the Nigeria uh, experience or what you see in in Nigeria as the uh, greatest uh, technical and uh, political potential where the CCAC and the IFL can help deploy. Uh, to catalyze the mitigation consistent with the 1.5. Uh, I know you are not part of uh, IFL, but you are a partner of CCAC. So uh, welcome and uh, please. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I had some internet connection. I hope uh, you can hear me now. Um, we can hear very well. Okay. So um, being a partner of the CCAC, Nigeria has uh, come up with a uh, a national action plan to reduce the short-lived climate pollutants of which, of course, the HFCs are part of it. And um, uh, the a big measure that we have for the HFCs is the elimination of the HFC consumption. Uh, and uh, we plan to phase out the HFC by 10% uh, by 2030, and then 50% uh, by 2040, and then go ahead to 80% by 2045. So uh, um, this was uh, approved by our executive council. That is the council of our ministers is uh, the highest uh, approving council in Nigeria. So politically, we are uh, willing to, to, to work on these HFCs and to reduce these emissions, especially because this will help us with uh, achieving our NDCs. So um, what the CCAC, what I think the CCAC can do is to support countries like Nigeria to implement a refrigerant management strategy that will help uh, in uh, having a strategy of uh, a proper destruction, cycling, or even uh, um, uh, uh, not just destruction and recycling, but of course, uh, help in uh, the proper management of this uh, refrigerants at the end of its uh, life. And then, of course, it can create opportunities again for carbon credits, which uh, Nigeria, well, uh, particularly Africa, we are, are interested in like um, opportunities and getting the carbon credits, which can uh, help our economy, uh, our, the whole of, uh, I'm talking of Africa in general, not just Nigeria. And then um, the CCAC can also support countries to develop effective policies on the HFCs. It can, like 
I told you uh, the abatement measure that we have in our national action plan is to face uh, the use of the HFCs. So, uh, uh, how much can help in uh, uh, having a phase out rule? So, uh, another thing that that strategy can help is a better means of disposal of equipment, which will have a great impact in reducing emissions. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we, there's also the recovery of the refrigerants at uh, its uh, end of life which uh, uh, improving the installation of uh, the, the, the HFCs in um, air conditioners and uh, fridges and all of that. So if we can have a strategy, like I said in the beginning, all this can help us in uh, like achieving our targets and then of course reducing the HFCs in the atmosphere and then having a cleaner air which will affect both uh, the health and the environment. So I think uh, I, I was... Yeah, thank you so much. I, I agree with you. Having a strategy is the, uh, is the best approach. Uh, let's go back to Uli, please. And, uh, you know, would you like to discuss a little bit about the barriers and what to do to, uh, to overcome these barriers? So thank you, uh, Basam, and, and uh, I think there are uh, are several barriers, and, and as I mentioned, there there the natural refrigerants it's it's a key interest uh, from our view, and and I think, uh, and it's it's correct, of course, as as was said earlier today in session one that there are safety issues, that are flammabilities, that that there are issues with the use of these natural refrigerants, and and I think. To overcome such barriers, I think CCAC could play a, a quite crucial role uh, again, uh, trying to develop more national standards, trying to take the international standards from international level and making them sort of trickle down to national levels. Um, I think there are um, uh, an additional thing that maybe also the scientific community could look into is that, of course, the the HFOs, uh, it's the replacement for HFC or one of the replacements for, for HFCs down the road. Uh, and, and what has been sort of uh, at least got to our attention is, is that, of course, these, these, some of these HFOs and also some of the HFCs are, are being decomposed. And, and that is mainly why they have such a short atmospheric lifetime and, and is good for the Montreal Protocol. But, but the, it has also been identified quite large uh, knowledge gaps when it comes to where these decomposition products are, are ending up and and at least that is one area that that I think we we need more more knowledge in a way and, and a scientific community like CCAC could maybe look into that area and and also that would of course be to try to avoid uh, unintentional challenges that that might emerge uh, down the road or 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 further down the timeline when when we are implementing the Kigali for real. Excellent. Thank you, Ole. Uh, Okada-san, if you, uh, you, you're still with us, would you like to um, make a comment there on the on the barriers? Uh, I would like to uh, mention one more thing, uh, that is uh, to strengthen and promote measures to uh, prevent uh, release refrigerant into the atmosphere from the existing uh, uh, refrigeration and air conditioning equipment. Uh, for this purpose, the technical certification system of the contractor, I mean, uh, qualification or uh, obligation of equipment inspection, or the strength of penalty of, uh, for uh, illegal release, etc., can be mentioned as uh, measures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Okada-san. Uh, Irene, can I ask you the question about uh, what can the CCAC and the IFL uh, focus to make sure that we achieve mitigation by 2030 in the sector or a specific part of the sector? Sure. Um, well, I think one where the CCLC already started and also other um, initiatives as also the one I'm working for, I mean, the GSZ Proclima, um, doing inventories to really know what actually you have in front of you, because we have discovered that in, in many instances, countries have a rough idea what kind of ODS banks and also HFC banks could be there. But then when you really ask, um, well, where is it? Where are the cylinders? 
then sometimes they haven't even found them because that wasn't all the information. So this is something that's really important also from coming and, and um, um, having done projections on global HFC emissions and ODS emissions. All um, um, projections are only as good as the assumptions are and assumptions are sometimes really difficult to, to take. So the more real scientific paper or in, knowledge we have from the ground, the better. And another thing I think we, what we shouldn't forget is that the collection of unwanted ODS starts with the individual technician that actually has to do it. And if this individual technician is not motivated to do it, then yeah, we can stop all our efforts. There is no need for having destruction capacities or anything like this or beautiful strategies. And the individual technician usually sees it's a burden for him. This is what we hear a lot of times it's not paid for, it's just burden, then I'm having this uh, return in my cylinders, I'm having to have more cylinders and things like that. I mean, we have uh, some experiences from Europe where the systems work partly. I'm not saying they work like full-fledged, but they're uh, definitely working better. But this is only because we have a long tradition of technicians having to follow a lot of rules. And also because here, it's completely clear that the, um, the one that's owning the, the equipment is paying for this service. Mm -hmm. And this is the first thing that we hear from a technician in, in many countries. Yeah, but I'm not paid for that because he cannot tell his, his contractor, well, I have to put it in the bottle and that's why I have, to, I have to charge you an hour more because it just takes time to put up the vacuum and things like this. So it's actually an uh, economic, back turn for these individual technicians to actually follow the rules. And I think this perception has to change. And yes, policies are important, but the enforcement of policies are even more important. And if we can create a momentum on this, and I think CCIC can really also help in yes. getting the awareness and, and, and also yeah, make it more, yeah, more important to really follow those rules it would be a good start. Thank you, thank you, Irene. And I like the uh, the experience from Norway, uh, tax and reward. I think. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, there is a, there is a question. Uh, BP is asking. Uh, uh, in Japan, recovery rate is forty percent. If recovered fluorocarbon is reused into equipment, uh, six, sixty percent of this will go into the air. It is not clear to reduce the, the production as much as recovered. I think this was a, a question where from the presentation of uh, Mr. Toyozumi. So I don't know if uh, Okada-san would uh, like to uh, respond to this. No, he says if if the if you recover and reuse, then and again sixty percent will go into the air. Yeah, uh, our target is very uh, high. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Maybe in the written uh, written answers, as we're running uh, a little bit short of time. So I just want to give one more minute uh, to um, uh, Asma if, to, if she wants to add something, please, because we didn't have a chance to have you at the beginning. Asma, if you would you like to add something? Um, yes, uh, I know that uh, where most of the problem lies is in leakage. About 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions from refrigerants comes from end of life uh, leaking. So uh, I think we have to look at that very well. Like I said, if we have a strategy and then maybe a policy that can uh, enforce this, then I think uh, that will be good. And in a country like mine, anybody can just wake up and uh, say that he's a technician and can do uh, work on these ACs and uh, refrigerators. But uh, once we have a policy that can be enforced, I think that will help us in uh, reducing emissions. So uh, that, that I think uh, my point here is that uh, we should have a strong policy or a strategy that will have some kind of um, enforcement uh, parts that will help in reducing this uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers and to the panelists. An interesting discussion. Uh, I'm sorry from the session three if we've taken uh, a couple of minutes. And uh, I hope that all the panelists had their uh, points to make. Uh, again, uh, the uh, the participants can uh, can share their views, and those will be shared. 
Uh, Nathan, I will pass it on back to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, and and thanks to everybody in uh, in session two. That was a, a wonderful, very concrete and robust uh, set of presentations and and discussion. Um, I think we could uh, we could easily give you another another half hour, and you could keep going. But unfortunately, we are right on time, uh, and I don't want to uh, give a short thrift to uh, to session three on uh, cross cutting elements. Um, just a couple of housekeeping elements. So uh, before I hand it over, uh, the, the Q&A function doesn't seem to be working, but the chat function does. Uh, anybody who does have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and if there is time during the discussion to, uh, to respond, uh, the discussants will respond to it. And otherwise, we will retain your questions and we will uh, attempt to get them answered and reflected in the, in the report for the science policy dialogue. But Without further ado, I'd like to hand this over to Natalia Alaskiva. Uh, she's a team leader for National Climate Change Action at the FAO. She's going to be moderating this session on cross-cutting opportunities and challenges. And I remind everybody, if you're talking, please turn on your camera so we can see you. Uh, thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, I've been switching on everything, so hopefully it works. Just wait in a couple of seconds to warm up. Okay, I don't see myself yet, but hopefully it comes. Uh, maybe I could start with a brief uh, uh, opening for the session. Uh, since uh, I was asked also to share the FAO perspective, and then we could go to the program and then discussion. Uh, what I would like to um, probably uh, to start with is to uh, just outline that indeed in the world where we have one third of the food produced and uh, then it's either lost or wasted, uh, the development of sustainable cold chain is a key to achieve zero hunger and other SDGs. So we as FAO, of course, uh, we pay a lot of attention to this topic and it's extremely important for us. Uh, we believe that the development of the sustainable cold chains can contribute to food loss reduction, improve food production and food security. And uh, therefore, of course, it's extremely important to use sustainable modern technologies along the cold chains to meet the goal of the Montreal Protocol. Uh, it was already scientifically demonstrated that old uh, technologies can harm the environment in terms of uh, both ozone depletion, but also global warming. And uh, there have been already lots of uh, uh, research papers and practical experiences providing that uh, uh, the importance of uh, finding sustainable and climate friendly alternatives is high and there are already some solutions. Uh, the 2016 Kigali Amendment, which was already referred to, uh, it the calls for the phase down in production and consumption of um, uh, HFCs. And uh, I would like to remind also the Roma Declaration, which was uh, accepted last year, and uh, which calls to develop sustainable and efficient solutions in the refrigeration and uh, air conditioning sectors. So that's why indeed we have to look for these uh, sustainability uh, solutions and uh, of, of course also link up different agendas and uh, actions. Um, uh, the FAO, which I'm representing, uh, we already assist in both developed and developing countries to design, finance and implement sustainable cold food chain solutions. And uh, these solutions, of course, should be integrated within broader agricultural and food security development strategies. And of course, we are working to, towards this direction. Just one practical example, for example, that uh, in 2015, uh, we've been performing a cost benefit analysis of uh, solar milk coolers uh, in Kenya. And uh, this was a great success. And uh, for example, among the benefits identified, uh, we had uh, better milk quality, increased revenues, 60% of GHE reduction, and having cold storage uh, unlinked to electricity grids. And of course, uh, we are supporting the countries, but we're also working with other institutions such as UNID, the GF, of course, the CCAC, and the Montreal Multilateral Fund to enhance uh, food cold chain and solutions. So uh, I would like to jump directly to the session, just checking again if the video is working. 
No, seems to be not. Okay. Uh, Uh, now we're in the session three, uh, which is covering cross-cutting opportunities and challenges. And the session would be starting from a uh, scientific background presentation and the policy uh, maker presentations. And then we will jump into the guided dialogue with uh, three questions. So that's why I would like to start with the first part of the session and uh, uh, call for scientific background presentation. Uh, uh, which is uh, going to be done by uh, Mr. Ravin Shakara from Colorado State University. The floor is yours, please. Oh, thank you very much. I hope you all can he hear me and good day to all of you. Um, I just want to make a few very quick small points. Uh, now, my big point is think big. Let's not forget why this whole issue started. And that's where we can find a lot of, of savings in a way. Just to be sure, the whole idea of refrigeration and air conditioning is to do two things. Keep people cool to avoid heat stress. And number two, for the production, preservation, transportation and use of food, which is a big part of it. So I'm going to come back to that at, at the end. Um, <clears throat> so, hmm. I'm all going back to the wrong slides, but I can fix it. I think. Okay. So. Um, Thank you for introducing me. I don't have to tell you who I am. Uh, you can just call me Ravi. And if you have questions, I'm sure um, Nathan can give you my email address. Okay, the first point is HFCs are not yet a problem. They're actually a very small part of the current problem, but they are a problem to be avoided. And this, to me, suggests it's an opportunity. It is an, it's, it's not already, already in the atmosphere so much as how much could be in the atmosphere. So, Tala beautifully illustrated this issue this morning. This is a plot showing the megaton CO2 equivalent of HFC emissions with. Right. With Maybe I apologize to cut in. Sorry, uh, I don't see your slides. I uh, oh, you don't? No, <laughs> sorry for that. Maybe I, don't, I hopefully I'm not the only one. Uh, Can you see you have... these slides now? I, I cannot. I... Oh, Are you sharing your screen? I see. I know what happened. I there clicked we... on share the screen, but <laughs> then I didn't put another button. So should I do it like this or? Go full screen. I think it would be better to go full screen, but yes, we can see it now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is kind of a cartoonish version of what Pallav showed me showed this morning of the CO2 equivalent emissions of HFCs without Kigali amendment that goes like that, and with Kigali amendment that goes like that. And also with maximum maximum technical feasible reductions, which would go like this. So to me, this entire sector is our opportunity. Okay, this is something to be avoided. Now, is that the only thing that we can avoid? No. He also pointed out there are major gains to be made in doing this refrigeration uh, better. This is in terms of reduction of CO2 because of energy efficiency. I can just tell you a personal story. We just had two heat pumps replaced in our house. It had few key benefits. First, it uses propane. Second, the amount of energy it consumes is less. The third, which is not an insignificant uh, benefit, was it completely reduced the amount of noise within an apartment. So there are other other kinds of benefits to be gained 
when you do these kinds of things well. So this essentially shows you the energy gain, energy efficiency gain, and the picture here taken from, I can't remember exactly where, I think it's from IGSD, um, very clearly shows how much more electricity you can save or use it for better purposes or not put up the new power plants to emit more CO2 or do something else. So that's a very clear indication of the, what the future we can avoid. Improving efficiency is a big thing and putting it in terms of the kind of quantities we were talking about, Shah et al. have shown the kind of reductions you would get in terms of, of 25 gigaton CO2 equivalent by 2030, 33 by 2040, 24, uh, 40 gigatons by 2050, and 98 gigatons cumulatively up to 2050, uh, going, up, going beyond. Now, is that all that we can do? I want to bring up another topic that was touched upon by a couple of people um, that we really should not forget. This issue of HFC 23, I just don't like to see it fall through the cracks. This is a figure that just came out in a paper we published in Nature Communication. Solomon, Susan Solomon is the first author with Joe Alcamo you'll hear from tomorrow. Um, and the point simply is HFC 23, which is the most potent of all HFCs, it has a global warming potential of like 12,000. It is an unwanted byproduct. And if this is kind of may be, being generated and released because in the production of like HCFCs, it is something that could be curbed. Montreal, a Kigali amendment needs to take probably stronger action to deal with 23. Or, or the picture shows is there's a big discrepancy between what the atmosphere says and what the reporting says as to how much HF, HFC 23 is being emitted into the atmosphere. So, the uh, Miss Irene Pabst's presentation kind of made, made, a, made a key point. It is not just the HFC capture, and what people are doing is destroying the HFC that's captured, HFC 23. Is that the right approach is something to think about. So there is a big potential here to do something. My last point is something what the chair of the session told me about, talked about, is let's kind of go back to the point I made. Why do we have the HFCs at all? It is because of trying to keep ourselves cool and to preserve food. So the big picture is, the, let's think about the whole system. HFCs is one of the cogs in this machinery. Efficiency gains is another approach. But the big thing that's happening is food production, distribution, usage that is causing all sorts of issues. Some few facts that our chair just mentioned, roughly 1.3 billion tons of food is lost every year with the cost of $1 trillion per year. Think of all the people it could feed and let alone how much you could save. It's the FAA estimate is also like 4.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalent being wasted. And there's a whole issue of how much could be saved in terms of adequate cold chain um, and, and, and this, you know, the ability to distribute and all that. So better cold chain of which HFC is a component can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save costs. costs. And it leads to, more, to a more sustainable planet. And if you were to kind of think about, if you're history buffs, one of the key reasons for famine is not just an availability of food, it is the ability to preserve and distribute food. That is a statement from Florence Nightingale, which said, there is food famine, and there's money famine, and there's distribution famine. Okay, so my last point simply is think big. 
there's a lot to be gained if you think of it as a systems approach and, and in dealing with HFCs, and it kind of opens up the world. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Ravishankar. Uh, if you could stop sharing your screen. Yeah, I um, don't know how to do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> could Tatiana do that for me? Uh, one second, here. Oh, oh yes. somebody did. Did that happen? Good. Um, it's, uh, it's a mystic, but it works. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for very valid points, and thank you for calling us to think big, because indeed sometimes we're uh, we don't see the forest behind the trees, right? So we, we have to be thinking uh, with a kind of wider picture. Now I would like to call for the policy maker or implementation presentation to be done by Nurka Karajal from the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of the Dominican Republic. The floor is yours, please. Uh, Norika, I see you, but I don't hear you. If you could check your sound. We still can't hear you. Good morning. Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Can you me? Yes, please go on. Thank you. Estoy en la conferencia. Okay. Good morning. I'm going to share my my screen for the presentation. My name is Nurka Carvajal from Dominican Republic. I want to share the Dominican Republic HFC by South Down Progress and National Strategy. We have a, a humidity tropical climate with a lot of hours of sunshine. Excuse me. We have um, a new humidity tropical climate with a lot of, of hours of sunshine for years. Air conditioner is essential for the productivity and well being and the cold change to preserve our food and medicines. Buildings and hotels are large users of cooling. The Dominican Republic, given us insularity, is very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, such as an increase in temperature, the rise in sea level, and the extremely variability of rainfall. Average temperatures are expected to increase between one to three C by 2050, increasing the demand for the cooling. An example can be seen in the humidity comfort levels for a year's average in Santo Domingo. You can see in this graphic. Cooling implementations implications in Dominican Republic. High electricity bills and GHG gas emission from refrigerants. HFC emissions and also from electricity consumption from fossil fuel resource. According a market assessment done in 19, 
in 2019 with UNEP UPORI, 14 to 60 a, a percent of the electricity consumption in hotels is only for air condition. In public buildings, it's about 30 percent. Can Republic refrigeration and air conditioner sector. Uh, it's about 81.88 consumption correspond to 1348 9.08 to air 408 and 793% for air 4108. The followed by also no significant, no significantly R 407C, R 507A, and R 4138. The high consumption of HFC 134A is related to its role to as substitute for CFC in many applications since the 90s and more recently as substitute for some HCFCs. Okay. Uh, refrigeration sectors that generally requires a refrigerated fluid, domestic refrigeration, and commercial sectors are the most active in the market for refrigeration and air condition. It is gaining more and more importance in the Dominican Republic. Therefore, the discussion of the CFC at sectors. The increase of the HFC is particularly important for long term planning. HFCs will be much longer used than HCFCs. A United Air Conditioner Units are subsector is the most dominant subsector contributing to the HFC. Sales has been growing since 2013 and future growth rates are expected to be as high at 7% annually. In 2016, this result is over 6,200 units in use, of which 45% were self containing and 52 were split units. In 2025, the number of the units is projected to reach 1.46 million. The total amount of HFC substance is projected to increase in the next decade from 20 from a 2016 to of total of more than 200 2300 metric tons to 4600 metric tons to 2025.
Dominican Republic National Dominican Republic National Cooling Strategy. The Dominican Republic is committed to address the rising cooling demand with energy efficiency cooling, known ODP and a low GWP gases in best practice to reduce the consumption. We started to develop the of national cooling strategies with the support of UNEP United for Efficiency and financial by the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program. The working group is led by the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Energy, Council of Climate Change, in collaboration with tourism stakeholders, technology providers, financial institutions, civil society organizations, we began in 2020 and 18 with the market assessment initiative where was when the market assessment initiative um, the consultation meeting was a, of the strategy was begin between the 2018 to 2019. We make some training workshops and make presentation of the national cooling strategy in the awesome day, 2019. The NCS early draft submitted for approval in 2020. And we present the panel in the panel the NCS in Energy Efficiency Day and also Day 2020. Uh, Mrs. Carvajal, if I could speed up you a bit because we would like to have also discussion after your presentation. So okay. just checking how much time do you need. Thank you. Okay. This doesn't want to work. Yeah, I think you're going backwards, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dominican Republic National Cooling Strategy team into solution purpose with the cooling matters, cooling policies, legislation, and programs, electricity sector and cooling market, a strategic recommendation, MIPS and levels. Data, data collection, registration, and testing, rebuilding codes, cold chain optimization, financial resource, linking the HFC based on, on the Kigali Amendment, enabling activities, linking the NDC of the Paris Agreements, capacity building. Critical consumption of HF134A is considerably higher than others in the market activities. Alternative, the of hydrocarbons as refrigerants for is increasing propane in air conditioner units and the mixture of pure propane and is obtained in domestic refrigeration. Ammonia has been presented in the country for more than six decades in low temperature refrigeration, psychoplantain, psycho and man-made substance, which includes HFC 245FA and HFC 365 MFC and methyl formate are used in the manufacture of rigid form. 
Due to the expected increase in HFC's consumption, the government has decided to take early steps to address HFCs. Here we have summoned a proposal for activities to facilitate ratification of the Kigali Amendment and related development of licenses system as well as capacity building and other technical assistance related activity for adopting alternative to HFCs. I don't know why. But... Well, it seems to be freezing. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not friendly with technology. Today. If you could just uh, very shortly wrap up, because I think we got the main messages, and we're happy to see this level of commitment from the government. If you could have still a couple of words to close. That was the last, the last um, slide. Thank you. Ah. Thank you very much for the presentation. So we've got uh, basically a very nice combination of uh, practical country experience with a bit of uh, higher level scientific overview. And um, now uh, I would like to uh, run to the, uh, let's say, second part of the session, which is uh, focused on the guided dialogue. And uh, we will have uh, three colleagues uh, with us. Zarin uh, Osho from the International Solar Alliance, uh, Patrick Blake, uh, Program Officer from UNEP, and Kevin Fay, Executive Director, Alliance for Responsible Atmospheric Policy. And uh, we have also three questions which we would like to discuss within this uh, panel. So what I would like to ask maybe to uh, colleagues, uh, please unmute yourself and show. So we're just checking out the technology. Hopefully it works now. I see Patrick. Not yet other colleagues. Hi. Yeah, now I see that in. Hello. Excellent. Thank I don't you. see Kevin. Ah, okay. Excellent. So uh, maybe we could uh, start with the first question and uh, the, the first question is, uh, um, uh, where you see the greatest technical and political potential where CCAC can help Lloyd to catalyze methane mitigation consistent with 1.5 pathway by 2030? Uh, who would like to go on with the, with the response? Should I ask Patrick? Okay, yeah, I can start. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Thanks for the invitation from uh, CCAC. Um, as you mentioned just briefly, I, I'm from UNEP and I'm uh, working on the United for Efficiency initiative, uh, a global initiative on energy efficiency in um, appliances and lighting, but a large, a large amount on the cooling products. So happy to be here today. Uh, and that brings me, uh, I, I think, to the, uh, the point of the question um, on areas uh, to work on. As has been mentioned uh, throughout today, um, alongside um, the refrigerants, uh, energy efficiency um, is, a, is a key area for the country's industry uh, to work on um, and to work on those at the same time. Um, and that includes um, uh, different areas. Um, there's been different policies and different um, recommendations uh, that have been discussed, including on, on uh, building codes and on, um, um, on standards. But I wanted to emphasize the, um, the latter as, as one of the key areas uh, for development of minimum energy performance standards uh, for the, the cooling products. And that uh, we see uh, countries, um, including both the refrigerant and the efficiency into the standard uh, now, um, and through the initiative I work on, um, uh, we've developed uh, some recommendations uh, for this through what we call a model regulation uh, guideline, and that brings together the different um, 
the different requirements uh, for energy efficiency uh, for room air conditioners, um, understanding that that's a, a, one of the main products that will be purchased over the years to come, that it's very important for countries to, to implement minimum energy performance standards in the near future before that growth happens. Um, and um, uh, so that is available. We developed it uh, with a range of input from countries, um, as we heard from the Dominican Republic, a country we're working with uh, in the previous one, uh, but also a range of other countries um, throughout Africa and uh, throughout Asia as well. Um, and I would encourage uh, that um, uh, to be to want the one aspect uh, to consider um, both on for development of standards uh, and then also for the tool that uh, we developed uh, something that could be uh, deployed. So I'll stop there um, and, and pass it back to you, Natalia. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask Zerin to add if you could also build on what we've heard already and somehow expand what else you would see is very important. Is that a question for Zaren? Uh, yes, I could repeat the question once more. And, uh, yeah, we were discussing what are the greatest technical and political potential where CCIC can help deploy to catalyze methane mitigation consistent with 1.5 pathway by 2030. Uh, Zaren, are you able to hear us? And uh, I think there is something with your mic. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I, I did not hear who the question was addressed to. I thought uh, Kevin's going to take that one, but I'm happy to take it. So firstly, thank you so much, CCAC and SAP, for um, having me here. It's it's a pleasure to join you all on behalf of the International Solar Alliance. Um, and what I do very quickly at the International Solar Alliance is that I'm a project expert and I'm uh, basically working with the Secretariat of ISA, which is the International Solar Alliance, in developing something called as the seventh program, which is a thematic area for the International Solar Alliance on uh, heating um, and cooling areas to be solarized. So um, I think it's very much in line with the discussions that we are having here. And uh, Natalia, to your point of what actually could be, you know, the greatest technical or political um, asset or where CCAC has a huge role to play, I, I would imagine that to be in, in the area of making non-CO2 emission um, or non-CO2 emission mitigation as powerful as the CO2 emission mitigation potential. I think what is important to mention here, and lots of my colleagues uh, previously have also mentioned this, SLCP emissions have the potential to reduce the Arctic warming by two thirds. I think that in itself is a very powerful mitigation tool. And um, what I want to mention here is that um, time being the biggest constraint. So whatever we do needs to be done in a holistic and a very integrated manner. There's no silver bullet and uh, we are running out of time. So SLCP mitigation can help you. And I think Professor Ramakrishna just put up that slide. I think Pallav had put that up um, on the mitigation potential of SLCPs and what that means um, for global warming is a good reminder for all of us to know what the SAP and the CCAC is capable of doing. Now, having said that, um, let me, you know, steer here towards uh, the cold chain sector. Uh, like I said, ISA, the International Solar Alliance, is actually developing a thematic area in the um, aforementioned uh, subject, the section. Um, one thing that I want to mention here is ISA is not technology agnostic. We, as the name suggests, are... Um, several member countries that are promoting the use, expansion and adoption of solar energy. And the idea here is to be able to mix um, promotion of energy efficiency, low GWP or zero GWP refrigerant gases, and by doing so, changing the source of power to solar or solar hybrid. And the reason I mentioned this is because most of the countries that we have studied and our members of ISA, we noticed that a lot of countries have been using diesel backup generators or kerosene as a chilling, chilling element for cold storage. 
which might help you in creating a cold storage or you know access uh, for to cooling for farmers but doesn't really help with localized air pollution and coc uh, co2 or non co2 emissions but having said that um, access to cooling does multiple things in the cold chain sector it reduces your uh, food loss post harvest food loss and it also helps you you know um fulfill the gains under all sdgs the paris agreement the kigali amendment to the montreal protocol and in addition to this the beirut's pledge and the un resolution on food loss um one thing that i want to sort of touch upon very quickly is um you know the 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 group before us uh, my colleagues were discussing about end use i think one thing that i want to also sort of highlight is the maintenance and service sector which is where the sap and the ccac has a huge role to play because in the country that i come from india the servicing sector is highly um, is largely informal so being able to sort of formalize that sector is going to help and one last thing before i close this would be uh, to leave the ccac and sap with the thought of the covid vaccines um you know we are talking about food cold chains but the current trials that oxford is doing with pfizer are actually testing covid potential covid vaccine 80 degree centigrade what do we have that is going to allow us to create this global infrastructure that that has the potential to allow you temperatures of minus you know sub zero degrees and i think cold chains there have a huge role to play and of course most uh, most people are talking about dry ice the problem is when dry, dry ice evaporates it's co2 emission so with that i'll let i'll let you continue natalia thank you uh, thank you very much and thank you very much for bringing this health dimension which we were not touching about uh, before at least within this session i would like now to ask uh, kevin fate to add on this question uh, kevin should i read it again or you remember this no oh, no i i remember it uh, thank thank you natalia and, and uh I'd like to say just in a kind of a sum based on what Patrick and Zaren uh, commented on that, that these two key areas of energy efficiency and cold chain are key areas where I think CCAC has the ability to make a huge difference. Um, CCAC was very strong in, in helping to educate and develop support for the Kigali Amendment under the Montreal Protocol. Um, as part of that, the HFC initiative was started. And one of the things that we did at the time is we created the Global Food Cold Chain Council, which was bringing industry together to help support the expansion of sustainable cold chain. Uh, working with FAO data and, and needing to expand that data, um, some of the early things we saw was that there was a 10 to 1 benefit for greenhouse gas emission reduction through expansion of a sustainable cold chain. That if you had penetration of the cold chain, in developing countries, as you have in developed countries, uh, that you could basically save the greenhouse gas emissions, the equivalent of the, of the country of France. Um, so there's big benefits here in order to pursue this, but it takes something like CCAC to help coalesce the momentum and the support. Um, uh, for example, at the Montreal Protocol meeting last year in Rome, they adopted the Rome Declaration on the role of the protocol in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions through through uh, and food loss and waste uh, through sustainable expansion of the cold chain. Uh, CCAC could help rally support for things like uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3. There's a group called Champions 12.3, but they're having they're struggling to get developing countries to sign on to that. So it would be great if CCAC could encourage its parties. Uh, to all become supporters of 12.3, and we're encouraging the champions group to have a more consistent outline of how they would achieve those objectives. 12.3, by the way, is the reduction of, of food loss and waste by 50% by 2030. And uh, I thought the presentation that Nairka presented for, uh, of their national cooling plan was the type of implementation process that we should be encouraging. But I know that countries are asking, where are the financial resources? to do this um, and what specifically do you want us to do? Uh, one of the things that we've started with the Global Food Cold Chain Council is it, with UNEP Ozone Action is this uh, data gathering project on the baseline of what the cold chain is in, in, in developing countries uh, to help provide that base knowledge so that we could then work on what that is. The Champions Group is trying to set up a financial mechanism to help support expansion of the cold chain and help to support 
support activities. So if CCAC could get its arms around that and encourage their parties to participate in that fashion, it would be very, very helpful and very, very productive. Secondly, I'll just say with regard to MEPS, very good opportunities. The growth markets for air conditioning and refrigeration are the developing country markets, but you have to, and MEPS would be a great addition to that, but they have to be done carefully because the MEPS poorly designed can also be an economic disaster to the citizenry of that country. And so, and so to the extent that CCAC can help educate countries about that and help promote that, that would be tremendous. Thank you very much. Very valid points and very good point also on the financial side, right? Because uh, indeed, the ones we're calling for the action, we have to see right. how it's going to be covered and financed. Uh, now I'd like to go for the second question, which is uh, also provides us with a lot of uh, possible entry points. We would like to see what are the key scientific, technical or political barriers to overcome, to bring the measures to scale, and how can uh, the SAP or the broader CCAC scientific and technical community help uh, overcome these barriers? So try to be specific uh, what exactly you see as, as uh, the stumbling blocks and exactly what we could be doing either as a scientific community or even broader to somehow tackle the issue. Who would like to go the first? I'm happy to to address that. Um, one of the things that the uh, SAP could be very helpful on is helping in furthering the understanding, working with FAO on digging into the database of the food loss and waste contributions, um, and and so that we the climate the climate policy process is very data centric in terms of where they're willing to put funding. And, and we need a better understanding of what those benefits are. Uh, food loss, which relates mostly, which relates to food that doesn't make it to market uh, versus food waste, which is most post-consumer. Um, and, and so it, it would be very helpful for the SAP to be able to provide uh, additional uh, analysis and, and, and identifying the compendium of information starting with the FAO database, which is a very good start, but with working with IIR, working with industry groups and, and other places to help improve that understanding as ways to move forward, because that will that's what will help push the success of finance mechanisms. Thank you very much for bringing this up. Uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, we were recently actually launching the new platform on food loss and waste from FAO side. So we'd be more than happy to, uh, of course, uh, improve its uptake, but also share as much as possible and fill it uh, with additional data and elements. So I would like to ask then Patrick and Zerin, who wants to go the next and add on on the barriers? Please speak up. Yes, Zerin. Um, go second in line because uh, my point is very similar to the point that Kevin made. Um, given that I was just explaining that uh, because ISA as an organization is not technologically agnostic, we do promote solar technologies. Um, one thing that I personally came across in the process of developing this program for ISA was the fact that um, most of the numbers that we have that FAO put out, A, were really old. So with regard to the data, and second, I, I also think that there is a need for CCAC and SAP to sort of step up and put out a lot more new numbers on what the integrated mitigation approach for something like, um, you know, solarized or clean powered coal chains would look like. And what would the LCCP or the life cycle performance analysis for the coal chain sector look like? I think those would be my two quick points on data in, in relation to what Kevin said. And in addition to that, um, I, I don't know if this is uh, necessarily what CCAC can do, but I know certainly they can promote this, is the idea of um, being able to encourage governments and the private sector to take on a more hands-on role, which comes from the fact that we need some mechanisms in place that would help in financial risk mitigation. So we talk about a number of innovative financial and business models, you know, cooling as a service, pay as you are model. But before you get into that stage, um, we need to be able to figure out what are the exact locations and how do you, uh, you know, analyze the credit worthiness of a, of a given agribusiness or a, you know, state government or whoever your client is. 
So I think another point, just to add to Kevin's point on data, would be um, you know innovative ways to understand how to mitigate financial risks. Thank you very much. It's very point, and indeed it's for CCAC, but also beyond. So probably we have to be taking it also as FAO. Um, is uh, Patrick? Would you like to add something to this point? Sure. Uh, thanks. So I'll just add briefly on what Sarah and Kevin said. Um, I think another area uh, is on regional collaboration um, and uh, and really to, to champion some of the work that is being done at the regional level. And what I mean by that is um, within the different regional blocks, uh, like in Southeast Asia or Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and so on, there's a lot of uh, different efforts, um, one now particularly in the cooling sector. Um, but I, I do think there is um, a, a role there um, to champion uh, both the efficiency side and and the refrigerant uh, side uh, to ensure that there's high ambition uh, on both those areas. And that, of course, provides benefits for multiple sectors, uh, multiple stakeholders, including the government, by the collaboration between them, uh, but then also um, for industry, I, I think, uh, getting to what the uh, Kevin uh, commented on earlier, for example, maps implemented poorly um, has a lot of in adverse impacts. Um, so, um, but when it's done collectively through a region effort, uh, that does reduce um, in the trade barriers between the countries. Uh, then, then just very briefly on the financing side um, is another area uh, of importance and there is um, a number of opportunities, um, particularly on financing of cooling, uh, efficiency, and refrigerants uh, through the Green Climate Fund. Um, I don't have time to extend on it now, but there's a webinar, and we can share the link uh, for that uh, that was hosted last month together with the GCF and a range of other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, maybe I would steal five minutes of your time because we're going still a bit over the agenda, but we got the last question, which I think is very important. So let's be um, very focused because the question is exactly looking where can CCAC focus to make sure that we achieve mitigation by 2030 in the sector or specific part of the sector. So uh, the question is very short, but uh, well, probably not the easiest one. So I would ask you to respond where CCAC should be focusing on. Who wants to go the first one with the response? I'll just reiterate that I think the cooling sector um, and coal chain provide huge opportunities um, uh, for CCAC that they've already had a, a very positive contribution towards. But there, uh, when we first got in, for example, when we first got involved and created the Food Cold Chain Council, it was primarily focused on the HFC transition. But when we learned more about food loss and waste, we realized the environmental benefits were an order of magnitude greater than just the HFC transition. And so the notion of the role of renewable energy, uh, such as Zarin talks about with solar and other renewable energies, um, uh, in this space, uh, both for cold chain and for cooling. Um, uh, it's just an immense area in terms of potential benefit. And, and what CCAC has the ability to do is to put a microphone and voice to its developing country parties uh, that, we could, um, that we could expand upon. And that would be very, very, very beneficial. Thank you very much for being very clear and specific. Uh, Zarin, would you like to add or comment? Not sure, thank you. Um, actually, very much um, along the same lines as Kevin mentioned, um, I think CCAC, there's no silver bullet or no one silver bullet to you know solving the problem of what it is that CCAC can do to achieve the 1.5 mitigation target. Um, but I do believe that the cold chain sector, the post-harvest food loss reduction um, is absolutely one of the most important sectors to work on, be just purely because of the numbers, the data do the talking for themselves. The, the mitigation potential is so huge. And what comes along with this is also the fact that there are other socioeconomic benefits that you get 
from just being able to do this one policy change. Um, I think I'm I'm going to just reiterate quickly on the point that I mentioned earlier about the COVID vaccines. You know, we are gearing up to be able to inoculate the entire global population, which is roughly, it's, it's like, what, 8 billion people in the world? Um, at this point, being able to develop cold chains would not only mean everything that, you know, all of us have spoken about the cold chain sector and the food logistics, but also um, what it means for, um, you know, fighting a pandemic like COVID. So that in itself is going to be one of the biggest tests of how it is that countries are able to develop a clean, sustainable uh, food and vaccine delivery mechanism. Thank you very much. Excellent point. And Patrick, would you like to conclude on this? Thanks. Um, again, just to add um, to Zarin and Kevin, um, one area to bring together the, the larger cooling um, sector is through the National Cooling Action Plans, as we saw, saw in the Dominican Republic um, and, and many other countries uh, working on this. Uh, so that is one, um, one way to collectively um, put together a comprehensive plan for countries um, that I think is uh, very important to have that, those timeframes and the different activities for the broader uh, cooling sector. Um, but again, not to sound like a broken record, um, on minimum energy performance standards um, are do provide um, the benefits as far as um, implementing a policy uh, for the highest consuming um, uh, product, um, um, and that's air conditioners. So uh, I believe that that is. Um, one of the key actions that should be promoted. And that, of course, uh, provides multiple benefits, um, including for the broader um, um, energy sector um, by providing more stable grid uh, and also providing um, um, financial benefits to the end consumer uh, through reduced electricity bills. Uh, so I, I do believe that that is one of the key areas that should be uh, highlighted and uh, encouraged uh, for countries to implement uh, if they have not already. Uh, and if they have, um, it's likely that they should be putting in place higher and more ambitious maps uh, that include both efficiency and refrigeration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our presenters and uh, panelists. And just to bring also one point from the chat box uh, uh, from uh, Richard Fennelly, who says that CCIC must push uh, preventive maintenance for energy saving, emission reduction and protection of the coolant inventory, which is excellent. So maybe I would uh, stop on this point uh, because we're going a bit over time and then hand over to Nathan for, for the guidance and uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, thank you to all of you for the, the, the wonderful interventions, very concrete advice on what we can do as a coalition going forward. Um, we are over time, uh, but I think it was worth it uh, to conclude this discussion. I guess I would say uh, just as a, a final point, matters of business um, for this dialogue. Uh, everyone, when you close out your screens, will receive a post-event survey, uh, which will give you an opportunity to weigh in specifically on the questions that were asked to all of the panelists in all three sessions. So you have an opportunity to provide written comments. Uh, any comments that were not uh, addressed in the in the chat function, um, we uh, you please add them to the survey questions, and we will make sure that uh, that we address them in due course. They will certainly be in the post-event. Uh, report. Uh, we will be putting all of the slides and presentations up on the uh, the web page by the end of this week, uh, along with all other background materials. And I guess just as an overarching statement, I, I think um, for those of you who don't know me, I actually come from the HFC world. I started as a young, newly minted attorney uh, working uh, to support negotiations in the Montreal Protocol and evolved from there, uh, hopefully in uh, in better ways uh, uh, and strengthened through that process. So HFCs in particular are very near and dear to my heart. I think that it's sort of one overarching message that I think I could take from all of the three sessions is that um, HFCs and the phase down in Kigali is really an opportunity for us to address cooling and refrigeration as a system. Um, why? 
uh, people need cooling, what they're using it for, the refrigerants that are used, the efficiency of the machines, the opportunities to avoid growth in cooling, and how those refrigerants are managed at the end of life. Uh, it, it requires systems thinking. You need to be thinking about every step in the process before you start the first, the first step down the road towards uh, you know, uh, implementing refrigeration or, or, or cooling strategies. Uh, the CCAC is well placed to support all of the active uh, uh, partners and, and actors who are involved uh, in every element of this uh, of this system. Uh, and uh, and I very much looking look forward to to working with uh, our our partnership, uh, our rapidly expanding partnership over the next decade to help us achieve our ambition uh, on the path to 1.5. So uh, with that, thank you all again. Um, oh, one final uh, note, this has all been recorded, uh, so you can go back and watch uh, the entire dialogue on YouTube. Um, uh, that'll also be up by the end of the week. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night, afternoon, day, and morning. Thank you.